Hello everyone and welcome back to Lewis Fiction and welcome to the Spectacular Spider-Man Season 5 Movie Edition. This is the entire Season 5 in full compilation of all the episodes so you can get the full experience without any interruptions, without me constantly doing intros and outros, and you can enjoy the full season in its entirety. With the added benefit of no interruptions and being able to follow the story and character arcs a lot more seamlessly. With that being said, here is the full movie version of The Spectacular Spider-Man Season 5. Episode 1, The Creative Process. We cut to Midtown High. Construction is just about finishing on the building from the destruction caused at the end of Season 4. Everyone is back for senior year, the last year of high school. Peter is pumped. His life is actually going pretty well for once. He's looking to end off his high school career on a high. He's got the girl, money's not really an issue at the moment either, to his concern, and life is generally good. Peter makes his way into the school halls and sees Mary Jane Watson. Every time he sees her, it's like he saw her for the first time, once again. We will get a sense that they're really close, through the visuals of the episode. They will walk each other to class, talking about how stressful this year is going to be. Not only will they have finals, but they'll have to start thinking about college. Immediately, we get the idea that both Peter and Mary Jane haven't really had the time in any capacity to even think about college right now. With Spider-Man, Peter is only just starting to think about school again. Mary Jane doesn't even know what she wants to do either. They make it to class, and as they both sit down, the teacher welcomes them all back to a brand new year. The final year. But before they get started, he introduces a brand new student that will be joining them for their final year. Her name? Janice Lincoln. Now, Janice Lincoln will be a very mysterious and closed-off individual. Not the same way that MJ was when she was first introduced, but more in a way that there is something a bit suspicious about her. Keep her character in mind, but she will now become a regular throughout the series, the same way in which Flash Thompson and the other catalogue of Peter's friends are. After school, we will spend a few scenes with MJ and Peter. They will be hanging out and they will be happy. They will grab a coffee together and walk through Central Park. Everything seems to be going well in their lives, especially Peter's life, who hasn't felt this happy in a very long time. And we get the sense that he finally feels like he's won. The city is safe for now as well. We maybe get a slight hint that Peter is taking his eye off the ball. A massive theme of this whole show building up to this final season has been the balancing act between Peter's relationships and personal life and the work he has to do as Spider-Man. We will continue this theme here, but instead of Peter negating his personal life, he will put Spider-Man on the back foot slightly, as he has finally accepted MJ into his life for good. This is when they stumble upon a filming location for a brand new movie produced by a company called Rocks on Pictures. They are filming for a movie called Stiltman. Now, Stiltman will be expressed as this very cheesy superhero movie that this company is trying to produce. And Peter, as an actual superhero himself, will feel slightly mocked by this as well. MJ and Peter decide that they should try and stay out of their way until they get roped into one of the action sequences as one of the assistant directors mistakes them for extras. This will be a funny section of the episode as MJ and Peter try and navigate their way out of the film. However, as they do, they will stumble across the caravans at the back of the set. They will both hear shouting coming from inside and someone hits someone else over the top of the head. They will look at each other with concern. Peter will approach the caravan with caution as he looks to investigate. When a man bursts through the door, Peter's spider sense goes off, but he's not quick enough to get out of the way and gets knocked over by the man running. MJ helps Peter up as they approach the inside when a voice can be heard behind them, telling them to leave immediately. It's the director, Simon Krieger. Peter and MJ run for it as they escape. Once they get to a safe location, she asks what the hell was going on back there, and Peter says that he doesn't know, maybe it was just a little dispute. Maybe a little falling out. MJ tells Peter that it was definitely more than a falling out, that was really something suspicious. Peter disregards it slightly, but amends that he'll keep an eye on it. Once again, representing the calm and laid-back nature of Peter's character at the start of the season. After everything is settled, MJ will mention if they're still on for watching a movie later at her place that night, and Peter will say, of course. We will cut to a few scenes later, when Peter will return home. Aunt May won't be home either. He'll give her a call to make sure that she's okay, however, she won't answer. Peter will think, that's weird, she's usually home by now. He turns on the TV, however, to see that the production of Stiltman has been closed down overnight, after suspicion of violent action from higher-ups over fraudulent activity behind the scenes. Peter realises that the Stiltman debacle went a lot deeper than he first initially realised. And with all the underground criminal activity that's happened over the years, with Tombstone, Silvermane, Kingpin, and even Hammerhead, he can't ignore this. This could go a lot deeper than he first initially realised. He's dealt with these types before. He also realised that MJ was right. Maybe he should have investigated further. Peter stands up off the couch thinking to himself that he's going to amend this situation. 
Spider-Man swings through the city on his first triumphant swing this season. MJ will give him a call mid-swing asking where he is, and Peter will have to give a rain check, telling her the situation. MJ will be disappointed slightly. You will be able to tell through her voice. However, she understands the sacrifices of being Spider-Man, and that Peter has got to do what he's got to do. During the next portion of the episode, Spider-Man will team up with Gene DeWolf to uncover the mysterious Stiltman incident. Gene DeWolf will still be sour with Spider-Man when she first sees him. However, she will conclude that they have to set aside their differences to help each other. Captain Stacy was fond of Spider-Man, but DeWolf isn't, setting the stage for trust to be built throughout the season between these two characters. During the investigation, Spider-Man will break and enter, using his very out-of-book methods to uncover information. Jean isn't as flexible, nor is she as trusting as Stacy, and it will become apparent throughout the coming episodes, especially this one, that she doesn't go about things the same way that Captain Stacy did. Either way, they uncover the mystery of the Stiltman incident, as they arrest someone known as Frank Costa, who turned out to be the man who beat down the other guy that Peter and MJ saw in the truck. The reason as to why isn't fully realised yet, apart from the fact that money is involved. Frank Costa was owed money, thus why he beat the other guy down. It's also discovered through some criminal records that Gene DeWolf pulls up that Frank Costa also had ties to Lonnie Lincoln, aka Tombstone's criminal empire, back during his reign over New York City in season 1 and 2. And Spider-Man's worst fears about the situation will be realised. This does go a lot deeper than he first initially thought. Even though they don't both agree to their methods, Gene DeWolf and Spider-Man will come to a truce, knowing that they'll have to work together to uncover this massive mystery. Peter will lay out his experience with the underground crime families of New York, and Gene DeWolf will have to accept that. And finally, the filming of Stiltman will be shut down for good, with Spider-Man also saying that if they want to make a superhero movie, they've got one right here. We will also get the impression that Gene DeWolf isn't really fond of his jokes either. After quite an amusing interaction, we will come to the end of the episode where Peter is on the phone with MJ. He apologises about not being able to make it to the movie, but will tell her that she was right about the Stiltman situation. She will say, I told you so, and Peter will say that he shouldn't have ignored even the little things, realising that he may have been slightly distracted. They tell each other goodnight, and that they'll speak tomorrow. Just as he puts the phone down, Peter hears the door open downstairs. It's Aunt May. He goes down to greet her when she's on the verge of passing out. Knowing what happened with her heart previously, Peter panics, but Aunt May says that she's fine. She's just swept off her feet with work. After Martin Lee's arrest, trying to run Feast has been almost impossible for her. It's getting harder and harder. Plus, she doesn't have the suave or concrete convincing nature of a ruthless businessman that Lee had, so also trying to find the funding for Feast to stay open is also getting harder and harder as well. Peter sees the stress that she's under and tells her to take a break. May says that she can't. Unfortunately, the world is making it more difficult to live nowadays. She heads off to bed when Peter gets a glance of an overdue bill letter. Peter hasn't seen one of those in a while, but maybe times are getting tougher and maybe they're in for a rough final year. Episode two, Sacrifice. We start our episode in the dead of night. It's Central Park and a couple are walking through on a romantic evening. They look at each other and right before they're about to kiss, the man gets tackled to the ground. The woman screams out as a pair of red eyes screech at her from the shadows. The man groans out in pain until it stops. The woman runs out of fear until her screaming stops as well, and they are never to be seen again. We cut to Aunt May downstairs with the television on in the background. She is flicking through papers and papers of bills that have started to rack up. The news coverage comes on for the day, explaining that due to the consistent destruction to the city, due to conflicts that Spider-Man has with his enemies around him, has caused a mass inflation within New York City. And the people in all areas are affected by this. As some small businesses are going bust, criminal activity increases, and as people lose their homes as well. It's a crisis, and Spider-Man is at the heart of all of it. Peter comes downstairs just as the coverage ends. Aunt May tries to hide the papers quickly, so Peter doesn't notice. But Peter has seen that look on May's face before, and he knows exactly what it is. He saw Bills a few nights ago, but it's worse than he initially realises. Peter says that he has to head off to school, as Aunt May waves him off. We get a narrated section from Peter, as he thinks to himself about the situation. How can he help May? He's already struggling to balance Spider-Man stuff along with having a girlfriend and studying for his finals this year as well. What is he going to do? And now he needs to get a job? But he has to help May no matter what. If Uncle Ben taught him anything, it's that with great power comes great responsibility. And as much as he's been reminded time and time again that that applies to his Spider-Man life, he's also got to think that another great responsibility in Peter's life is Aunt May. No matter what, she has done everything for him, and Peter can't neglect that. 
Peter will get to school and will meet up with MJ. They get talking and they will catch up. When MJ reveals that her aunt, Anna Watson, hasn't been feeling great lately, Peter asks if she's okay, and MJ says that she thinks so, but she worries about her sometimes. Peter says that he gets what she means. MJ will say that she's not getting any younger, and she knows that one day she'll have to make the hard decision to accept that life sometimes moves on. Anna Watson is the only person that MJ has left, other than Peter. As they get to class, everyone is talking about some mythical creature that has been rumored to be wandering around New York City. Peter catches wind of this. However, since it's getting close to Halloween, Peter doesn't really think much about it. Apparently, the rumor is, is that people have been seeing a living vampire out on the streets of New York at night, taking people as its prey and feeding on their blood. MJ laughs it off, saying it sounds like a bad horror film. Peter seconds that. But Flash, in particular, is adamant that it's real. He shows Peter and MJ a newspaper headline with a very low-quality photo of a man who looks like he's wearing a cape. Peter tells Flash that it's just a guy wearing a cape, and Flash will tell Peter that he's naive. If a dude with spider powers can exist, then a New York vampire can too. Peter will chuckle it off as he returns to class. Professor Warren will walk into the classroom for their biology lesson, and he will tell the class that they have a special lecture today that will in fact be led by his brother and the new owner of ESU's laboratory section, Miles Warren. Miles will enter the class, and Peter will recognize him from the man that took over after Dr. Connors left. Peter will think to himself that he hasn't seen that place since Connors did in fact leave. Miles will go on to teach the class. He will teach a lesson in genetics, similar to what Dr. Connors specialized in. However, instead of being centered around regrowing limbs to help regenerating health, it will be about cloning. Cloning parts of the human body altogether to help people with cancer and other life-threatening diseases. He'll be sharp, calculated, and a lot firmer than his professor brother. Miles will instead be a teacher with a lot of discipline, and will almost execute the reason as to why he works in a laboratory and his brother does not. After the lesson, Peter will stay behind to talk to Miles. He will say that he likes what he's doing, and is happy that he's continuing Dr. Connor's work to some extent. After hearing from Dr. Connors during the Summer Break film, Peter says that he'd be happy to hear it. Miles says that he's simply exploring a direction that Connors never had the capability to do so. He also goes on to explain how he's very aware that Connors underutilized him and Gwen. Peter will ask how so and how does he even know who they are? And Miles will explain that during his first few weeks at ESU, he checked some of the ESU records and found that the intelligence that they displayed was outstanding. If it wasn't for some important and very classified work that he got roped up in at the time, he would have contacted them and brought them back on board. Peter is outstanded by this. Miles Warren leaves telling him to have a good day. MJ waits for Peter outside and asks what was that about. Peter tells her that he just got complimented by him and Gwen as well. Apparently, Miles looked into when they worked under Dr. Connors that one time. As they walk down the hallway, they all go on to talk about May's bill situation, and MJ loops it back around, telling Peter that he should go and ask Miles Warren for a job. Peter will go on to say that's a big commitment, since Spider-Man is a massive part of his life, and also the school stuff going on right now is really important, since finals are on the horizon. MJ will tell him that it could help with the school stuff, since he'll be studying in a lab, and you'll make enough money to keep May afloat as well. Peter says that you're right. And just before Peter goes to leave, MJ asks if they want to hang tonight. And Peter says, of course. And she says that she'll be around at his at seven. We cut to later that day when Peter arrives near ESU, looking to see if he can get a job there. But just before he can reach the front door, he is eventually distracted when from above the ESU window climbs and screeches a wild gray looking man with a cape. Peter is caught off guard at first as it jumps into the night. Peter thinks to himself that they can't be serious. He changes into his Spider-Man costume and chases after it. The living vampire is real, Peter will think to himself. He can't believe that Flash was right. Peter follows the vampire until he stumbles upon it, attempting to dig its teeth into someone's arm. Spider-Man will say that Halloween isn't for another week. What's going on? He webs up the vampire, but it breaks free, lashing out at Spider-Man. A fight between the two ensues, and Peter is struggling to get it off him. The fight rages on, and Peter is astoundingly outmatched. It's almost as if the vampire has Peter's skill set, or a very similar strength system. Everything Peter throws at it, it combats, and even throws back, kinda reminding him of Taskmaster ever so slightly. It's almost like this vampire is identical to Peter. During the fight, the vampire will manage to seek its teeth ever so slightly into Peter's leg. Peter barely noticing it while being in combat doesn't really pay much attention to it. However, after the fight is said and done, the vampire manages to escape into the night after beating Peter. But now that he knows it's real, the fight is well and truly on. Peter returns home that night, as MJ is waiting in his living room. She is with Aunt May having a hot drink. MJ asks how the talk went with Miles Warren, but Peter says that it was good, but MJ can sense that something's not right. They go up into Peter's room and he explains the situation. She notices blood seeping through his trousers on his calf. Peter lifts it up to see a tiny wound, 
MJ asks, did that thing bite him? And Peter says that he didn't think so. He needs to get that checked out, MJ will say. And Peter says that it's fine, super healing and that, playing it off as if it's nothing. MJ will say that, well, at least they can spend the night in, right? Then right on time, Peter gets a notification about a crime about to go down in Queens. He says that he'll be right back. It's really close by. And MJ holds her head down. And Peter turns around and says, he's sorry. MJ says that she gets it and just to go. She says that she probably should be spending time with her aunt anyway. Peter nods as he swings off into the night as MJ looks on. We then cut back to the vampire as we see the blood that he drew from Spider-Man. Spider-Man's blood genetically fuses with the vampire and he grows and he grows. His back arches and crackles until he screeches out a bigger monster than before. And with that, we cut to black. Episode three, hidden in plain sight. We start the episode with MJ and Anna Watson. MJ looks down and Anna asks what is wrong. Not being able to explain the full situation to her, she just explains that Peter has other commitments and it gets her down sometimes, that he can't come and see her more often. It's like she puts too much effort into their relationship and she knows Peter is trying to put it back, but he can't. The weight of Spider-Man is really getting to her after admitting her love for him and it's all boiling over. We then cut to Peter, who the next day is going back out to search for a job at ESU. Peter texts MJ asking if she's okay and he doesn't get a response. He thinks that's weird, but goes about his day anyway. He enters the lab and everything is different. The last time he was here, Dr. Connors was in charge. However, all the tech, all the equipment, it had been upgraded to the highest level. Peter snoops around slightly as it piques his interest. He notices the Oscorp logo on one of the microscopes. He pulls himself back slightly as he's taken back by how Professor Warren got his hands on all the top of the range Oscorp tech. And with that, Warren walks in from behind. He asks what Peter is doing here as Peter says he apologizes for walking in unannounced. Warren tells him not to apologize. He assumes he's here on good merit. Peter obliges, saying he was looking for a job. He explains the situation that he thinks it would be good for his chances of getting into college. Warren looks at him with a raised eyebrow and says that his smarts are desired by any high-end college across the country, probably even across the world. There's another reason he needs a job. Warren steps closer to Peter. Peter gulps. Warren displays his intelligence, not only in the lab, but with people. Peter looks down and then back up to Warren. He says his aunt is struggling for money and he kind of needs a job to help. As Warren turns around to face the lab again, Peter panickingly goes on to explain his situation more, saying that he came to the place that he believed where his passion lies. He believes he could do a good job. He did under Dr. Connors and he believes he can do now. Warren will turn back around to face Peter and will nod in agreement. Peter is confused, no interview, no nothing. Warren will tell Peter that he's exceptional. And like he said before, him and Miss Stacy were some of the brightest minds to ever step through that door when Dr. Connors ran the lab at ESU. So yes, he will let him work here. Warren will go on to explain to Peter that his main passion overall is science. He wants others to explore and to love science as much as he does. We will get a scene where this is shown through how engrossed Peter and Warren become in a conversation about what Warren specializes in. They get talking and Peter learns as well as the audience that Warren does genetic testing to determine whether human organs can be cloned to replace degrading ones. Not only this, Warren reveals that cloning an entire human, if it ever becomes possible, could be the answer to humans that live for eternity. Cloning the perfect genes with no genetic defects would mean a human race with no disease, no cancer, no nothing. Peter is impressed and on board with his research. Peter's phone buzzes, however. It's Mary Jane. Peter says he has to go now, but it's been great talking to him. Warren smiles. As he says he starts next week, he'll send over the details. Peter thanks Warren as he leaves. The scene stays with Warren for a second. The scene settles, as it's kind of eerie. There's no music, no sound, but a still image of Warren, all alone. We haven't heard about any family other than his brother. We haven't heard of any relationships, any kids, anything other than his work. This final shot of the scene is to represent how alone Warren feels. His work is his life, and he'll be surrounded by it. We cut to Peter texting MJ back. MJ asks if they have time to spend with one another tonight. She's begun to miss him, and that holiday that they had in California was the most normal she has ever felt with him. Peter says that they should hang out that evening. Since it's a Sunday, they're not in school, so it's perfect. Peter says that he'll be over later, when police cars start to rush past Peter on the street. Peter thinks that it won't be anything big, and that he can be done in a heartbeat. He'll still be able to see MJ later. Peter suits up and webs after them. As he's swinging, he feels a tingling sensation in his side. He doesn't know why, but his torso on both sides starts to hurt. 
He just plays it off as lasting pain in all the battles that Spider-Man has done to him over these years. As he arrives on the scene, it's ESU, and it's on fire. The living vampire is back, and it's attacking Miles Warren. It's attacking the professor, and Peter doesn't even know why. Warren uses a taser gun to stun it in its path, allowing the police to arrive on the scene. However, the taser doesn't hold him down long, as the vampire lashes out again. However, Spider-Man arrives, and at the last second, kicking the vampire down. The fight rages on, as Spider-Man is determined to beat the vampire this time. He won't let him get away. Warren even helps Spidey, working with him. Eventually, the vampire is down and taken out. Peter, confused as everyone else, is trying to work out why the vampire went after Warren. The vampire is taken into custody by the police as they leave the scene. Spider-Man sticks around for a while as Warren places his face in his palm, realizing that the lab, his work, is all gone. Spider-Man empathizes with him, whilst also thinking about his chances at a job. Spider-Man says it'll be fine, at least just safe. Warren will tell Spider-Man that he's going to have to break the bad news to Peter, his new employee, in which Spider-Man leaves swiftly. We cut to Peter on a building, as Warren calls him to tell him the news. When he is abruptly cut off, Peter thinks, this is strange. He cut the call so weirdly and so early. We then cut back to Warren, who stands opposite a man who walks into the front entrance as he places the phone down. The man says the experiment wasn't a success, and Warren's face will turn to anger, saying that he's not doing this again. It's too dangerous, and now he's lost everything. His life was his work, and it's gone. The man says he provides his equipment. He can get replacements as long as he makes progress. Warren refuses still. He goes on to say that he will not continue doing this. It's dangerous, and it's going to get them both in trouble. The man clenches his fist. Warren demands to know what could possibly drive him to do it. He will tell the man that he cannot be threatened. He has no family, no lab, no nothing. And he can't even kill him because the man won't get what he wants. As we pan up, we reveal that the man is none other than Norman Osborn. He smirks and says you have a brother. He used to teach his son. Miles, under his breath, will say that he has a brother by blood, not by heart. Representing Miles' closed off and unempathetic nature, Norman says so be it. He will die. As Norman walks off into the distance, Warren shouts, Norman swiftly turns around, and Warren says, fine, he will carry on his work, but he needs his equipment back. Norman says he can sort that out as he smirks and walks off into the distance. We end the scene as we pan over to a piece of paper, disclosing a document about a man called Michael Morbius, a volunteer test subject whose DNA was taken to try and create the perfect clone. And with the Osborne and Warren mystery left open, we cut back to our friendly neighborhood Spider-Man, who is getting ready to meet Mary Jane Watson. Peter texts MJ, saying he'll be there soon, when the pain in his side starts to get worse, until, in his room just before he was about to leave, four human arms protrude from his sides. Peter screams out as we end the episode there. Episode 4, Genetic Mutilation. We continue the story as Peter panics. The arms in his sides cause him to get off balance as he falls over. Luckily, Aunt May isn't in. She's at work at the moment, leaving Peter by himself. Peter stands up, thinking about his next move. How did this happen? He'll think to himself. Peter looks towards the window and thinks about what Mary Jane will think of him. A part deep inside of him knew that she'd understand this situation. Heck, she's the only one who really gets of anything he goes through. But he can't. He can't let her see him like this. Peter decides to do the only thing that he knows how to do when he's stressed or can't think of a next move. Take to the skies. He puts the suit back on and rips holes in the sides for his arms to fit through and takes off into the skyline of New York City. We cut to Aunt May at Feast. A decent portion of this first half of the episode will be exploring this side plot thread of Aunt May at the Feast Center. After Martin Lee's imprisonment, she has been overworked trying to keep the shelter afloat by herself. She's struggling and this scene will be here to represent that. Dark circles under her eyes and a monotonal attitude will be present. She will be lost, confused, disorientated, overworked, and not only that, she has to think about bills once more. We will then cut to Mary Jane Watson, who is laying on her bed waiting for Peter to arrive. She will look at the time and it's 10 minutes past when he said he'd be there. He's probably just late, right? She'll think to herself. But as minutes pass, it becomes clearer that he's not coming. A slight tear rolls down her cheek as she wipes it away quickly, trying not to be caught up in emotion towards something that she knows is inevitable. She decides to go downstairs to see her aunt as she lay on the sofa, coughing. MJ goes over to comfort her, and Anna says that she's okay. 
Anna asks about Peter and if he's still coming over. MJ tells her that he isn't. Anna will look down and say that May has always told her that something troubles that boy and she doesn't know what it is. She will go on to say that ever since Ben died, Peter has been different. She wishes that MJ knew Peter from before. MJ, knowing that that's not true, can't reassure Anna that Peter is one of the kindest souls you'll ever meet without revealing his secret identity and what he actually does on a day-to-day -day basis. In the end, MJ just tells her that he's got a lot on right now. Anna Watson will then go on to reveal to MJ very hesitantly that she's gonna have to sell the house. MJ, confused and caught off guard, will react accordingly. What? She'll say. Anna says due to her rising medical bills and the rising cost around the city in general, she's gonna have to move out. MJ will ask, well, what will happen to them? Where will they go? Anna says that May has said that they can stay there if it comes to it, but really she doesn't want to burden May, as Anna at this moment in time is incapable of working while May is struggling herself. MJ says that she can work, but Anna insists that school is more important and getting into college is important as well. She'll go on to ask MJ, what is she actually planning to do? Has she figured out what she's going to do yet? And MJ will reply saying that she still doesn't know. She hasn't really had time to think about it yet. However, this will put more pressure onto MJ about thinking about what she really wants to do with her life past high school. We will cut back to Spider-Man, who is swinging around the city when he bumps into none other than Jean DeWolf. Jean will shine a bright light onto Spider-Man as he tries to hide away from her, but it's revealed that she is looking for him. However, when she does see him, the shadowy outline of his six arms protrude onto the sidewalk. This catches her off guard, and she screams, takes a step back, and aims her gun at him. Spider-Man assures her that it's just him, but he has no idea how this happened. And after briefly calming her down, Spider-Man asks what Jean needs, and Jean will tell him that something weird is going down, and that she needs his help. As we cut to Jean's office, she explains that she originally planned him to take him into the station lab, but she assumes people wouldn't be too pleased to see him like this, and Spider-Man agrees. She goes on to ask him how this happened, and Spider-Man says he doesn't really know, but he's hoping to try and figure that out. In the meantime, Jean says, hopefully you can help me with this. She says that she knows they haven't always seen eye to eye, but this is something that she needs his input on. She will pull up some files on a man called Michael Morbius. Spider-Man is confused, but she explains that this man was the vampire that he fought after they did some blood tests. Spider-Man will be confused and ask why this is relevant, except the unorthodox part about this whole situation is that Michael Morbius is a married man, happy living in the Bronx. Jean explains that she had officers check on him yesterday, and he's still there. The man isn't the vampire, because the vampire is locked up. Things rush through Peter's head. A clone, he'll think to himself? That would explain why he was attacking Miles Warren. Maybe he had something to do with this. Jean goes on to explain that it's not even the weirdest part. And then when Spider-Man didn't think it could get any worse, Jean tells him in the blood test that they did, they didn't just find traces of Michael Morbius' DNA, but yours too. Spider-Man's eyes widen as he's shocked by this revelation. He asks, how do they even know that? And Jean says that in the lab it looked as if Morbius' DNA was spliced with parts of a superhuman type DNA structure. When broken down, the spliced DNA was found to be made of two parts, one human, one spider. Assuming that there's only one Spider-Man, Morbius' DNA had been combined with Spider-Man's to create this monster. All of a sudden, Peter puts the pieces together. The fight rages on and Peter is astoundingly outmatched. It's almost as if the vampire has Peter's skill set. During the fight, the vampire will manage to seek its teeth ever so slightly into Peter's leg. Spider-Man tells Jean that that must be how he got the six arms. During his fight with the vampire, it sliced Spider-Man, meaning that whatever mutated version of his DNA was a part of the vampire got into his bloodstream, causing all sorts of wacky side effects. Jean says that that would explain it. But more importantly, she needs answers. And she needs answers fast, because wherever this vampire came from could potentially be dangerous, and it might happen again. Spider-Man will say he has just the guy that could tell them everything about cloning. Spider-Man goes to confront Miles Warren at the ESU lab, which is still being cleared out after the vampire battle. Miles is shocked by Spider-Man's new arms, in which he confronts him about it. Miles, however, is acting coy with Spider-Man, as if he knows some deep secret that he isn't willing to reveal. Spider-Man asks him about the vampire, to which Warren becomes even more closed off. Spider-Man asks Warren if he had anything to do with it, and Warren says that he doesn't know what he's talking about. Spider-Man squints his eyes and tells him that he should come clean if he knows anything, because this could get a lot worse. Spider-Man, now confident that he knows Warren is somehow involved with this whole situation, tries to press him more, but the more he presses him, the more that Warren becomes closed off. Miles Warren will tell him that he doesn't have substantial evidence pressed against him, and after collecting some files, 
he decides to leave the building. We follow Warren as he leaves the lab and enters a building halfway across the city. Spider-Man will also follow him as well and tell Jean that he's on his tail. However, he will lose Warren as he enters a random building in the middle of the street. Spider-Man will crawl through one of the windows that lay open on the top floor and tries to find him. However, the building is empty. It's almost like Warren vanished into thin air. We cut back to Warren as an elevator door opens and he steps out. A brand new secret underground laboratory with Oscorp plastered all over the equipment. He will walk over to a tube-like machine which will be shrouded in smoke. Warren will remark to himself that this has to work this time. As the smoke clears, none other than Peter Parker's face emerges from the cloud. Warren's eyes widen as he steps back and trips, falling over and smashing a vat load of chemicals at the same time. They fall and sizzle over his hand, to which he reacts by flinching away. After wrapping his hand up with some bandages, he walks back over to the tube again to confirm, Spider-Man is Peter Parker. Episode 5, Biological Crisis. We open up the episode with Peter swinging away from the building that Professor Miles Warren entered at the end of the last episode. He gets in contact with Jean DeWolf and tells her that he lost him, but he's definitely up to something. Somehow, he has something to do with all of this. Jean says that she's going to get a search warrant and Spider-Man says that he could just do it his way and then Jean tells him no. She says that they may be working together but they'll do this properly and by the book. They don't want to make this any worse than it is currently. Peter accepts this arrangement and goes back to contemplating his situation with Mary Jane. He holds his head in his hands as he can't believe he blew her off again. How could he get life so right only for it to go so wrong again? He feels an ache in his chest thinking about it. His body feels heavy and it's not because of the four extra arms he carries on his side. No, it's almost like his mind is too much for his shoulders. We skip a few days later. It's a bright sunny day and MJ goes into school and in comes Peter Parker and sits next to her. Peter asks how she is, and MJ blanks him. He asks her what's wrong, and MJ tells Peter that he knows what he did, and he knows what's wrong. Peter is confused and says that he doesn't know. She tells him that he blanked her for Spider-Man stuff again when they promised that they'd hang out last night. She sighs, and her eyes well up slightly. She'll tell him that she's trying to not let it get to her because she knows that he has that responsibility to be Spider-Man, and she accepted that when they decided to be in a relationship, but she's currently going through a lot right now. Peter places his hand on hers and asks what. MJ responds by saying that her aunt has to sell the house. Peter is taken back by this, and MJ goes on to explain that she's struggling to afford her medical bills, so they're going to have to move out. But they don't know how. They don't know where. Peter says that they could come live with her and Aunt May. Mary Jane places her head in her hands and says that she doesn't want to burden them both. Peter looks in her eyes and tells her that she'll never be a burden. MJ thanks Peter, and then Peter says that he'll 100% commit to her tonight. No more Spider-Man stuff for one night. Just Peter and MJ. MJ will smile and says that she'd like that. After class, Peter and MJ hold hands as they walk through the city on the way back from school. There's no swinging, no dramatic action sequences, no danger, just Peter Parker and Mary Jane Watson. They get into a conversation surrounding Aunt May and her working at Feast. Peter says that she's really worried about how much she's overworking. That's when MJ comes up with a great idea. She tells Peter that she really needs a job to help out with bills and stuff, so she could just come and work with May at Feast. Anna tells her that she doesn't need a job at this point, but she really doesn't have any other choice. She really needs to help out with the money problem, and also it could be good experience and help her get into college. She currently doesn't really know what she wants to do at this moment, and that's something that she's still trying to figure out. Maybe helping people and working at Feast could be a way into a future career. Peter says that's a good idea, and he'll call Aunt May now. He reaches for his pockets and pats his sides, and his phone is nowhere to be seen. He thinks that's strange. He never doesn't have it on him. He must have left it at home or in one of his backpacks when he was out doing Spider-Man stuff. If that's the case, he'll have to go around all the city searching for it. Those bags are a nightmare when they go missing. MJ says it's okay. They can speak to her later. She just wants to be with him right now. She throws her arms around Peter's neck and kisses him softly on his lips. They both smile at each other as their breath start to fog up in the lowering temperatures of New York City. They both feel the breeze, as Peter offers his coat to put over MJ's shoulders, but MJ says that she's fine. He definitely needs that more than she does. Peter laughs it off and agrees. We then cut to Miles Warren, who is in his office trembling, but why? What happened to him? He places a button on a communication device, holding his wrapped hand in the process. A man on the other side answers the phone. It's Norman Osborn. He asks if he's made any breakthroughs. Warren says that something happened and it's not good. Norman begrudgingly asks what, and Warren says that there was another accident at the lab. 
What accident? Norman will ask. And with the mystery shrouding Norman and Warren continuing, we cut back over to MJ and Peter. They are sitting on a park bench as the sun sets over the city skyline. MJ leans on Peter's shoulder. She says to him that she could do this for the rest of her life. Peter gulps. No one has ever said anything quite like that to him ever before. He awkwardly and quite stutteringly says that he could too. In this moment, we fully embrace that MJ is Peter's missing piece, and Peter is hers. It's a nice moment that will cement all the Peter and MJ scenes that we have gotten thus far in this episode. However, we then cut to Peter and MJ who arrive back at Peter's house later that night. They walk through the front door. However, something is off. They hear noises coming from upstairs, clatters and bangs, very unorthodox-like. Peter quickly becomes defensive, and MJ becomes intuitive. A plethora of things run through Peter's head. Has a supervillain found out his secret identity? Or could it just be New York rats that have somehow found their way into his home? What if it's something worse? What if somehow in his sleepy laid spider eggs and now he's got spider children? All these different things will run through Peter's head. Some funny, some very weird, but all very plausible considering what his life has been like over the last couple of years. If Spider-Man and supervillains can exist, then anything can at this point. Peter and MJ slowly creep past the kitchen and down the hallway to the bottom of the stairs. Peter shouts May's name, but no one responds. He thought it could be Aunt May, but Aunt May doesn't really make that much of a noise. Even so, Aunt May is still at work. She never gets home from feast until a lot later in the night, especially since she's been overworked to hell at the moment. But the noise is coming from upstairs. It doesn't seem organized. It seems like it's coming from someone that doesn't know what they're doing, which suggests an intruder. The noises represent someone who isn't sure of themselves. Maybe someone looking for something. Or maybe even someone disorientated. MJ and Peter decide to climb the stairs, ever so carefully, step by step. Peter could easily rush in there and deal with this situation, but he doesn't want to alert the neighbors. He doesn't want to alert anyone around them. This has to be handled securely and safely. The stairs make a horrendous creaking sound as they both travel up them. Until he's trying to purposefully be quiet, Peter has never noticed how bad the stairs actually are. Either way, as they reach the top of the stairs, the noises get louder, and they're coming from within Peter's room. This is when Peter fears the worst. It's got to be a supervillain of some kind, someone who's looking for something, some dirt on Peter, or maybe trying to figure out his identity. Peter thinks he has to deal with this now. He goes up to his door and stands directly behind it. And on the count of three, he bashes the door down. And to his surprise, he is struck by a man with six arms wearing a Spider-Man suit faced away from him. Not knowing what to think, Peter reacts suddenly, striking a web at him. However, the man dodges and flips around, shooting a web back at him. Peter goes flying back into the wall, and the man with six arms stands up from his pose. Peter stands back up and looks the man directly in the face. A face of despair and disgust turns into a gasp. Wait a minute, they'll both say to themselves, you're me. Episode 6, Clone Conspiracy. The episode opens up where we left off. Peter Parker looks into the eyes of Peter Parker, but with six arms. MJ screams out as Peter confronts the other Peter. He says, whoever you are, you need to explain yourself. But before the six-armed Peter could respond, a wave of pain comes over him as he collapses to the ground. Peter's spider sense doesn't detect any danger, however, but his heart rather sympathetically notices he's genuinely in a lot of pain. Peter once again asks, who are you? And when the six-armed Peter could speak, he stands. He proclaims that this can't be happening and asks who the hell he is. As the conversation as to who is the real Peter Parker goes back and forth, it then occurs to the six-armed Peter. He realizes he's a clone. He must be a clone. Professor Warren cloned Michael Morbius. He must have cloned him as well. But why? So many questions. He reaches out to MJ to try to tell her, to try to explain the situation. Professor Warren, the man he's been working for, has cloned him. And that is the clone. The clone swiftly turns around telling MJ not to listen to him. He's the one with the six arms. He's the freak. He says whoever this Professor Warren is, is clearly the man behind it all. MJ clicks. She turns to him and says wait. She pulls out her phone and rings Peter. When a buzzing noise comes from the six armed Peter's pocket, the other Peter, in shock, sits down at his desk. Realizing he didn't leave his phone at home. He never even had his phone in the first place. The other Peter then asks him if he knows who Professor Warren is, and the clone says no. 
They both go on to ask him what was the last thing that he could remember. He tells them both that he just got off vacation and he was uncovering the Frank Costa mystery. Peter's eyes widen. That was a few months ago. And it's revealed in this moment that the clone doesn't have any of his recent memories past episode one of this season. Peter places one of his arms onto the clone's shoulder and tells him to dig deep, to remember what happened when he first woke up. The clone tries to remember, but it's foggy. He assumed it was just another battle that he lost sleep over, but the more he talks about it, the more that it comes back to him like a distant memory. This portion of the episode will be a flashback to what really happened. We cut back to the end of episode 4, where Miles Warren first discovers that Peter Parker is Spider-Man. We replay the moment that he trips and falls, smashing chemicals onto his hand. As soon as he wraps it up, he goes over to the container once more. He presses a button, and Peter's eyes open. He notices Warren. Warren tells him that he's going to be okay, and not to be alarmed. Peter's head rings as he screams out. Warren tells Peter that's his spider sense, and he is not to be alarmed by his presence. Peter gets up out of the tank, and asks where is Mary Jane? Warren is confused. He doesn't know who Mary Jane is. Peter starts to ask questions about where he is and what he's doing here and who the hell Professor Warren is. Warren refuses to give him any answers at this time and tells him to get back into the tube so he can do further testing. Peter refuses and Warren tells him that he has to. Peter responds with saying that he won't do anything. Not until he knows what's going on and not until he knows that Mary Jane is safe. And then Warren tries to restrain him, seeing no other option. This is when a fight breaks out between the two. Warren tries to stun him, but Peter uses his spider powers to escape the situation. However, he seems a bit rusty, as if he's trying to catch his bearings for the first time. The lab gets trashed in the process, explaining why the lab was once again destroyed during Warren's interaction with Norman in episode 5. The clone escapes into the night, leaving Warren once again at square one. However, leading on from the flashback, we do follow Warren for a few moments afterwards, as we see him frantically try to dispose of the evidence that Spider-Man is Peter Parker. You see, Warren has grew a liking to Peter. In fact, he sees a lot of himself in him, as we've seen through the first couple of episodes when them two were working together, and he knows what Norman is up to. He hasn't been told his plan in full, but he knows that in some sense or another, Norman will hurt Spider-Man. They have a feud that goes beyond Warren's understanding, but one thing that he does understand is that Peter Parker is a good man, and he potentially has opened a can of worms that should have been left untouched. We cut back to Peter, MJ, and the clone. The clone sits in the corner, contemplating himself, while MJ confronts Peter about the arms. She asks him if this is why he couldn't come to see her, and Peter sighs and holds his head down, saying yes. MJ tells Peter that she knows him more than anyone. He shouldn't be afraid to come to her. Peter says that he didn't want her to see him like this, like some kind of freak. MJ tells him that he's not a freak, as she holds his face. The clone looks over and sarcastically remarks if they can get a room. They apologize, and the clone looks to the floor. Peter and MJ look towards him with concern. The clone then asks, Does that mean that all those memories with Aunt May, Uncle Ben, Gwen, Harry, MJ, they're all not his? They're not real? They didn't actually happen? Peter gulps and says, Yeah, technically. The clone infuriatingly slams his hand down on the desk, sending a shockwave through it and a crack right down the back. He asks again, Who did this? Peter tells him that he assumes it's Miles Warren, the professor. The clone says that he's going to go settle this as he heads for the window. Peter tells him to wait, but the clone refuses, saying he needs answers and he needs them now. Peter tells him to calm down, but the clone says the next time you find out your entire life is a lie, you try and calm down, as he leaves through the window into the night. A few seconds later, however, Peter breaks down with more pain in his sides. He screams out as MJ holds him, asking if he's okay. Peter says no. He's mutating. He can feel it inside of him. He explains the situation fully to MJ about the vampire and the arms, and MJ is in disbelief. Then his radio set on his desk alerts him to a situation downtown, a robbery in progress. Peter steps up, ready for action. MJ says he can't. He's not in a state to handle something like that right now. He can't do anything until they figure out what is happening with him. She tells him to let the other him deal with the situation, and Peter says that he doesn't think he's in the right place for that right now. Peter says the main priority is dealing with this crime, and then they're going to go find the clone and find out what's really going on and get to the bottom of all of this. MJ nods as Peter leaves for the scene. Spider-Man arrives as we see a lady with bright purple and green armor placing money in a bag. Spider-Man announces himself and she turns around swiftly punching Spider-Man in the face. She was that quick that even his spider sense barely caught it. A fight ensues and Spider-Man quippingly tells her that this isn't the right time to be a supervillain. He's kind of got other big stuff happening right now. 
They both fight each other, but she's so strong. Too strong, in fact. As the fight draws to a close, Peter starts to realise that his extra arms are more of a hindrance than any good. He loses the fight because of this, and the woman escapes, activating some wings in the process and flying off into the night, with Spider-Man left defeated and embarrassed, his pride slightly hurt as well. We then cut to Miles Warren, who is frantically still trying to find any evidence of his testing of Spider-Man to destroy it before Norman could get his hands on it. When the bandage that covered his hand starts leaking with a green-like fluid, something's happening to him. He starts to scream out as he transforms. That chemical that smashed onto his body, something in it is changing him. His body cracks in all sorts of ways. A big green monster is born out of the shadows as the episode comes to a close. Episode 7, Getting Older We begin this episode as MJ is on call to Peter as he swings through the city. He mentions how he just had his butt kicked, but he doesn't want to talk about it. His priority now is to find the clone and to find Miles Warren. Peter arrives to the building in which he saw Miles Warren enter a few episodes ago. He looks through it, trying to find a secret entrance anywhere, when he comes across a massive hole in the wall, which led to an elevator shaft. All the lights were dim. Water echoed throughout the metal confines of the long vertical hallway. Peter jumps down, activating his spider light so he could see. It was only designed to place criminals in the spotlight, not to light up whole rooms, which left him feeling uneasy, as only one part of the room at a time would be visible to his eyes. He relied heavily on his spider sense. Creaking noises would create terror in the air, but Peter didn't sense anything. No Miles Warren, and no danger. But whatever happened here wasn't good, until he heard a voice. Hey. Peter turns around. It's the clone. After having time to reflect, the clone came to his senses and calmed down. This interaction is awkward. It's almost as if the real Peter is taking his life away from the clone, but the clone understands the situation. He is Peter Parker after all. They both don't know where Miles went, and the clone explains that this is where he remembers waking up. Both Peter and the clone decide to set aside their differences and work together to try and figure out what is going on, to try to get to the bottom of all of this and find Miles Warren. However, just before they could discuss any sort of plan, Peter breaks down in pain once more, this time even worse than the last. The clone asks if he's okay, and Peter says no. He thinks his mutation is getting worse. He doesn't know what he's turning into. The clone says that they've got to get him help, and Peter says no, that doesn't matter right now. What matters is getting to the bottom of this, before anyone else gets hurt. Peter tells the clone that if Miles Warren is playing with fire, it's only a matter of time before the flame ignites. The clone argues back, saying, You're Spider-Man. You're Peter Parker. If something happens to you, then that isn't good for the city and anyone else. MJ won't have Peter. The city won't have Spider-Man. Peter looks up to him and says they will, as he looks at the clone sternly in the eye. The clone, taken back by this, closes off, whilst Peter gets up from his pain, saying that they need to move. They don't have much time. We cut back to the Parker household. Aunt May comes home from working at feast and lays on the sofa, no energy left whatsoever. She then gets up and shouts Peter's name, asking for him. However, he's nowhere to be seen. She assumes that he's out with MJ. However, she hasn't seen him in a very long time. This puts a slight shred of tension over her. She hopes he's okay. Meanwhile, she examines more letters. As she opens them, they read more rising bills. How much longer? can they keep it up for? We cut back to the building. Both Peters leave the building, but as they stand outside, both of them look at each other. Their spider senses, a big green monster swipes them from above. Both of them get knocked off their feet. It screeches among the moonlight. Both Peters ask the question, what the hell is that thing? Not having any time to ask questions though, they both agree to engage with it. Moreover, trying to escape it. The clone more able than Peter manages to fight him off by himself, injuring it. The monster escapes into the night, leaving both Peters on the street. Peter will joke, saying that he's getting slower with these growing pains. Is this what getting older feels like? The clone will frown at the joke. However, once again, before they could hatch any sort of plan or move in any sort of direction, the pain kicks in again. Peter breaks down to the floor. The clone holds him once more and tells him to hang in there. Peter screams out in pain. It's worse than ever. Peter tells the clone that if he doesn't make it, he's got to stop that thing and find Miles Warren before anyone else gets hurt. He grabs the clone by the collar and says that this is bigger than the both of them. This goes deeper than the both of them, and it has to stop now. Peter screams out in pain again as he starts to transform. His suit rips at the seams. His arms grow, claws expand from his nails, and his face transforms into that of a giant spider head. Peter, no more. Man-Spider is here. 
Man Spider screams out as the clone looks at Dead in the Eye. Man Spider stops for a moment before running off into the night. The clone looks on. In his own world, he may not be. Living in someone else's body, he might be. And after all of this is over, the chances of him fitting into life as he knew it are slim. But despite the odds, despite the situation, he knows and lives by the oath. With great power comes great responsibility. That's how he was raised. That's how in his mind he was made. This may not be his city. These may not be his people, but he will fight. He will fight for them because at the end of the day, that's what Peter Parker would do. And he is still Spider-Man and no one can take that away from him. The clone swings off into the distance, hatching a plan in the process. However, after all the wear and tear, battles and rips created by the other Peter's arms, he needs a new suit. He heads back home, or Peter's home, to grab some stuff. He searches through Peter's wardrobe and finds some unwebbed red prototype mask that he wore during his wrestling days and a blue hoodie along with some red joggers. He places it all out on the bed. It's not much, but it'll do. Then all of a sudden, there's a knock at the door. It's Aunt May. She asks if Peter's in there. Peter doesn't know how to react. He simply says yes, as to not frighten her. She enters his room, as Peter quickly scurries and covers up the suit on the bed. She says that she hasn't seen him in a while, and she says she wants to apologize for not being there. Peter doesn't say a word, but simply embraces her into a hug. Caught off guard, May is surprised at first, before she embraces him too. A moment of silence covers the episode. Peter says he missed her, as a well of tears builds up, the clone vigorously trying to hold them back. May says she missed him too. She says she better get back downstairs though. She has some cake in the oven. She asks Peter if he wants any, and the clone says no. He'll be okay. However, as May leaves, she notices out of the corner of her eye a red boot on the bed hanging out from under the covers. Turning her attention back to Peter, she smiles as she leaves the room, heading back downstairs. The clone holds his head in his hands, trying his hardest to stay composed, knowing that may be one of the last times he ever sees Aunt May ever again. He puts the suit on and leans out of the window, swinging away. The clone heads to MJ. He knocks on the window from outside a house and she opens it. He arrives into the room. She asks what happened to the suit. The clone says it's just something he threw together when MJ quickly realizes that the other Peter didn't follow him in. She asks, where is he? He says that's what he came here to talk about. He's currently transformed into a giant monster. The mutation that he talked about, it finally took over. MJ's eyes widen as she cannot believe what she's hearing. She steps back and sits on her bed. What now? But before she could even process any emotion, a bang and a scream. It's Anna. MJ rushes downstairs to see the man spider at the door with a gaping hole in the wall. Anna stands in the corner, afraid. The monster approaches through the house as she collapses from the shock in the hallway. MJ screams out her aunt's name as the clone swings in, kicking Man Spider away from the house. Man Spider grabs Peter by the torso and flings him back through the house, shattering windows and pillars. MJ begs Anna to wake up. MJ calls on the clone. The clone rushes to her aid and picks up Anna. MJ begs the clone to get her to the hospital. The clone tells her that he can't leave her here alone with that thing. MJ frowns and shouts at the clone, saying, That isn't a thing. It's Peter. She'll figure this out and tells him to go. The clone swings off into the distance as MJ stands face to face with Peter Parker, aka the Man Spider. Will Anna Watson survive? And will MJ talk the monster into its senses? Episode 8 My Night in Red Hair. We continue our story. MJ looks at the monster straight in the face. His eyes, despite how venomous and torrid they look, flashed human for a second. MJ could sense Peter in there somewhere, she just needed to find him. MJ speaks to the monster, begging him to calm down, begging him to stop on his rampage. However, Man Spider picks up MJ. She screams out as the monster takes her off into the moonlight to some unknown location. Jean DeWolf arrives on the scene a few moments later and sees a part of Spider-Man's costume torn off from the fight. She frowns. What happened here? We cut back to the clone, swinging Anna Watson through the city to the nearest hospital. He arrives at the hospital and admits her. She is wheeled in straight away. She has gone into cardiac arrest due to the shock that she was put under, similar to what happened to Aunt May in all those seasons ago. The clone stares as she's taken in. A doctor thanks Spider-Man, and because of his fast nature, she may have a chance. The clone nods and swings off, looking to find MJ and the monster. The clone returns to the house to find forensics and Jean DeWolf on site. She asks what happened to the costume, 
The clone, trying not to reveal too much as to what happened, says it's complicated and carries on with the search. He asks if she or anyone else saw which direction they took off in. DeWolf mentions that they've had a few sightings in the city, but nothing past that. They don't know where they're heading. The clone swings off in the distance, as DeWolf remarks how strange that encounter was. Spider-Man isn't usually as closed off as that. Plus, his costume's different. Who is this guy? He didn't sound any different to Spider-Man. We then cut back to Man-Spider. He has taken MJ with him back to Miles Warren's lap. This time, calmly, he places her down in front of him, almost like he's trying to tell her something. MJ is confused and asks if this is where Professor Warren worked, to which Man-Spider couldn't respond, but it was more rhetorical. MJ had a pretty good hunch that this is where the Professor worked, and even though a monster stood in front of him, there was still something inside of him that told him to bring her here. Although it was trashed, burnt and scattered, the place was a lab of great brilliance. At this point in the story, it becomes clear that Man-Spider can still think. Despite his animalistic instincts, among other things, the monster brought MJ here to help him, to see if he could transform him back into the man he always was. However, science wasn't her speciality like Peter's. MJ scurried around the lab, tripping over things, laying across the dormant floor, trying to find something, anything that could cure her love. Man-Spider sat and rested, until Man-Spider's spider sense went crazy. He screeches out as MJ jolts around, asking what it is. And with absolutely no hesitation, a massive green monster, the one from before, jolts out and attacks Man-Spider. It's mutated monster versus mutated monster. The fight rages on as they both cripple the lab even more. MJ trying to stay alive by purely dodging out of the way. However, the fight is brutal, almost like a Godzilla vs Kong Titanic battle. This one between two beasts, and one of the most brutal fights the series has ever seen. The green monster got an upper hand on Manspider. His slimmer nature gave him more speed and thus power behind his attacks. Manspider collapsed to the ground, leaving the green monster victorious. MJ sat crouched behind a table in fear as the monster cackled its way slowly over to her. It couldn't see her, but it could smell her. It could sense her. She notices a gas canister out the corner of her eye. As the green monster got closer, MJ got ready to pounce. And when it was approximately a few meters from her, she lashed out and jumped over to the canister. The monster screeched out and lunged over towards her. However, MJ sprayed the green beast with as much chemical as possible. It screams out in pain as MJ scatters across the room until she finds a Bunsen burner. She instinctively flicks it on at the switch and lobs it at the green monster as she watches him go up in flames. It screams out once more, rolling around the lab trying to extinguish the flames. However, it doesn't work. In fact, things in the lab start catching fire themselves. The green monster escapes into the night, pride and soul hurt by the fire. MJ, however, has no time to think about what she just saw and what the hell that was and what the heck is going on. Now she has another problem on her hands. Not only is Man Spider knocked out in the corner, but the entire lab looks like it's about to come down in flames. And she couldn't carry Man Spider out with her. He's too heavy, but she couldn't leave him either because still somewhere inside there is Peter Parker. She had to find a way to take out the fire first. At first, she tries to spray all the extinguishers from the wall onto the fire. However, it doesn't work. It only holds the fire back temporarily. As she looks around the room trying to find another solution, she then notices sprinklers on the ceiling. However, the sensors are broken, as they've not been set off. She thinks there must be a manual switch somewhere just for safeguarding. She searches around the walls as the fire grows. The heat begins to approach her every second more ferociously that she delays putting it out. As the flame starts to engulf tables and chairs, she starts to panic. But she can't give up. Not for her. Not for Peter. She finds a switch on the wall that says fire sprinklers, but it's locked behind a glass shield. She pulls it, but no use. It won't come off. She picks up the closest thing to her, a chair leg, and with all her might and force, plunges it into the side of the glass shield, shattering it in the process. Without hesitation, she leans forward and stomps on the button with the palm of her hand, and the sprinklers all set off, putting the fire out. As her hair begins to drip with water, she slides down the back of the wall and closes her eyes. She did it. She breathes a sigh of relief as she walks back over to Manspider. She places her hand on his face and promises that they will get help. They will bring Peter Parker back. And just as she says that, the clone arrives on the scene. The next portion of the episode will be the clone and MJ looking through Warren's research, trying to determine a cure for Peter. The clone uses his wits and Parker brain to put together pieces of research left around the lab. He manages to come up with something. MJ asks if it's going to work, because if it's wrong, it could kill him, or worse. The clone says it's their only option. They have to try this, and this is the only way to bring him back. And Professor Warren is gone. 
he can't help us now. MJ sheds a tear, but she knows that the clone is right. He walks over to Manspider and carefully injects the serum through a vial into his skin. And nothing. A few moments later, nothing again. He lay still, still unconscious. MJ starts to shed a tear as she lays her head on Manspider's chest. And then all of a sudden, Manspider starts to transform and shrink and returns Peter Parker once more. He's back. He sleeps and rests as the clone and MJ celebrate. They've done it. They've brought him back. And without the extra arms too. However, in a moment of joy and rejoice, MJ's phone rings. She picks it up. It's the hospital. MJ's face drops as the clone asks, what is it? MJ puts the phone down as she delivers the news. Anna Watson has passed away. Episode 9, End of the Road. It's snowing outside, it's close to Christmas, and it's a few weeks after the events of the previous episode. Peter will narrate to us over the top of panning shots of New York City, when we will eventually end up at Anna Watson's funeral. We pan through to May, who sheds a tear to her lifelong friend, as she places a flower down on her grave. Peter looks with remorse, as we pan over to MJ, who can't hold back the tears. After the scene, Peter will go to comfort MJ. However, MJ is off with him. Peter says that he's sorry. The act of Spider-Man caused all of this. MJ is aware of this, and just like many other times throughout this season, we can see the toll that is building and building constantly on their relationship and MJ's resilience. Back during their vacation, she told him that she was to make the decision whether she puts herself through the danger of dating Spider-Man. She made that choice and she has to live with that. But that doesn't mean it was going to be easy. She tells Peter that she just needs to be alone for a while so that she can process everything that has happened. Peter asks what that means and MJ says that she doesn't know. Has she made the right decision? She leaves Peter alone with his head low, but at least he's back. At least Spider-Man is back. We cut over to a scene where Peter stops a crime. It's late and Peter can't sleep. However, at the same time, the clone also arrives on the scene. They haven't seen each other in a few days and Peter asks what he's been doing and where he's been. He hasn't been staying at his house. The clone says that he's just been out and about. He also says that they need to catch up. He tells Peter that he's had a lot of thinking to do. He's not the real Peter Parker, and that's hard for him. It means that he can never see Aunt May again, or MJ. Peter consolidates him and tells him that he's sorry that all of this had to happen to him. The clone says it's okay. Peter goes on to explain everything that happened with MJ, and the clone speaks up. He tells him not to lose her, whatever he does. The clone says watching the way that MJ wanted to save him, the way that she did everything in her power to make sure he didn't die was true love. The clone tells Peter even though he is him, even though he has the Peter Parker genes, he was able to see their relationship from an outside perspective. She loves him. She loves him so much. The clone says that she'll need time, but to never let her go. He will say to never let her slip, not like how we let Gwen slip. MJ is special. Peter nods, saying he's right. He just needs to give her a bit of time. Peter talks about Uncle Ben, saying that it's hard losing a parental figure. So he understands what MJ is going through. He goes on to say that he doesn't know what he'd do if he'd lost Aunt May, saying that that might be the final straw for him. The clone says to keep both of them safe. Peter asks the clone what he's going to do now. The clone says he's thinking of moving away and starting a new life somewhere, somewhere where the burden of being Spider-Man might not take a toll on him. Peter asks what that means. The clone says that if he's not the real Peter Parker nor the real Spider-Man, he might as well take the liberty of living the way he's always wanted. He wishes he could do it with the ones that he loves, but he knows that's not possible. So he's going to move away and start again. Peter says that's heavy, but he doesn't blame him. The clone places his hand on Peter's shoulder and says that they've still got business to take care of first, that green monster and Miles Warren. Peter nods as the clone says they'll figure this out together and finish this once and for all. The rest of the episode will focus around Peter and the clone trying to track down the Jackal. However, due to the Jackal's unpredictable movements and appearances, both Peter and the clone have no idea where to start. Their first thoughts are to start with Miles Warren. Find Miles Warren and you'll find the Jackal. However, no one has any idea where Miles Warren has gone. His whereabouts are unknown and he's been missing after the attacks and the lab incident. This is where Peter and the clone start to theorise that the green monster must have taken Miles Warren, or even worse, that the green monster is Miles Warren. They have to both figure this out quickly, before he hurts anyone else. 
We cut to a few days later, when Peter attends one of his last days of school before they break up for Christmas. The talk of college and applications is becoming more prominent as we start seeing pictures and posters upon the wall of the hallways for different universities and colleges. Many people, like Flash Thompson, have already decided that they are going to go into the military, and others, such as Liz Allen, have decided that they're going to do a journalism course at MIT. However, in the case of Peter Parker, he has no idea what he wants to do in college. He has no time to think about it. During this scene, we will also get a shot of MJ walking down the hallway, and Peter will look on from afar, all the thoughts still rushing through his head. He thinks about what the clone said to him earlier in the episode. However, he can't help but ponder the thought of what if this is the end? What if MJ doesn't want him back? What if Anna Watson's death was the straw that broke the camel's back? Peter snaps out of this trance as Professor Aaron Warren approaches him in the hallway and taps him on the shoulder. Peter swiftly turns around to meet his encouraging face. Warren goes on to ask what colleges he's applied for and what course he's going to study. Peter says no, he hasn't really had much time to think about it, and Professor Warren claims that he doesn't really have much time left before the applications have to be in fully. Peter, realising this could be an opportunity to find out about Miles Warren's whereabouts, asks him how his brother is getting on. Warren questions Peter, saying, aren't you meant to be working with him? Peter has to quickly think of an excuse, and just says that it wasn't for him. And he goes on to say, just out of interest, is he getting on okay? He hasn't seen him in a while. Aaron Warren goes on to explain that he doesn't really see his brother much, as we alluded to earlier in the season. He goes on to say that he hasn't heard from him in weeks, but he usually goes weeks without hearing from him anyway so he didn't think it was anything out of the unusual. Peter, realising that this is a dead end, stops questioning the professor and goes on his way. Peter feels like every lead that could lead him to the jackal ends up becoming nothing more than a dead end. If him and the clone are to find this green monster, it's going to be on the monster's terms and not theirs. However, right on cue, something unfamiliar happens. Peter's spider sense starts going off vigorously. He gets reminded of that time that the Sinister Six attacked him at the school. And before you know it, a massive hole was carved into the ceiling as none other than a massive green slender monster made its way to the school hallway. It stared Peter directly in the face as other students started cowering and running away from it. The monster had finally tracked down Peter once and for all as after a few seconds, the monster lashed out at Peter, engaging in battle. The monster was quick, agile and ferocious. It was hard for Peter to get an upper hand on it. It knocks Peter to the ground and Peter closes his eyes. It's clear that he's still a bit rusty and still a bit weakened from what happened with him transforming into Man Spider and back. As the monster approaches Peter as he lay on the floor, Flash Thompson, who decided to hide in the room opposite to where the battle was taking place, decided to take a peek through the window on the door that separated the battle from him. He glanced over to see Peter lying on the floor. So many thoughts ran through his head. What does that thing want with Peter? And is Peter going to die if he doesn't do anything? and in a sudden burst of bravery, Flash launches the door open and shouts towards the green beast. He says, if you want to pick on someone, you are to pick on him. The monster turns around and looks at Flash in the face. However, immediately turns back to his goal, which was Peter lying there on the floor. Flash will repeat himself, and when the monster doesn't respond, he picks up the nearest thing to him, which was a piece of rubble broken from the ceiling that the jackal came through. And with no hesitation, he lobbed the piece of rubble towards the jackal's head. The jackal screamed out as it charged towards Flash. However, during this time, Peter regained consciousness and saw what was about to happen. And in a moment in what felt like forever, Peter made the conscious decision to web the jackal from the back to stop it from getting to Flash. And just like that, the green beast's attention was back on Peter. As they both engage in battle, Flash stares on in amazement. Peter Parker is Spider-Man. Peter Parker was Spider-Man all this time and he had no idea. Peter shouts at him to go, and go quickly. Peter holds off the Jackal for long enough for the clone to arrive on the scene. They both exert all their effort to finally take out the Green Beast and save the day. During the final moments of the battle, Jean DeWolf will arrive on the scene as well. However, as the Jackal is loaded into the back of a heavily armed police van, Peter sneakingly asks the clone to do him a massive favour. We cut to Flash Thompson outside the school as Peter Parker stands next to him. Peter says thank you to Flash. He'd be toast without him. Flash turns to Peter and says that he won't tell anyone about his secret identity. And Peter will say he doesn't know what he's talking about, as they both look up in the distance to see the clone swinging off after helping save the day into the New York City skyline. Flash is in disbelief. He saw what he saw. Peter Parker's Spider-Man, right? Peter will say he has no idea what he's on about. 
as he'll walk away, knowing that his secret identity is still partially intact. We will come to the end of the episode, where it was revealed that Miles Warren was the green monster all along, and they found traces of mutating chemicals in his system that transformed him into a massive green monster. Gene DeWolf connects the dots between him and the living vampire, and deduces that Miles Warren is at fault and is to be arrested accordingly. We will cut back over to Peter and the clone as they discuss the events of the episode. Peter has been in contact with Jean DeWolf as she confirms to him that Miles Warren was in fact the green monster. Peter relays this information onto the clone. The clone will then say that I guess it makes sense as to why he was obsessed with getting to him and Peter. However, his obsession with them both still doesn't really make that much sense anyway. He doesn't have a motive or any reason in the first place, or at least that's what they think. Peter will tell the clone that like most things in this city, it probably goes a lot deeper than that. There is probably a deeper reason to all of this. The clone says he can't help but think there is as well. The clone will then take off his mask to reveal blonde hair underneath. Peter will say that he likes his new hairstyle, and the clone thanks him. The clone says that he's thinking of leaving tomorrow, and Peter asks where will he go. The clone says he doesn't know. He's thinking about just going in one direction and seeing where it takes him. Peter says wherever you go, I wish you luck. He also asks, what will he call himself? And the clone responds, saying he's thinking of calling himself Ben Riley. Peter says that's a nice touch. The clone smirks as he looks down at his costume. He says even though he's not planning on being Spider-Man again, he thinks he might keep this costume just in case. Peter says, why not? And as the episode draws to a close, they share a mutual and respectable handshake. The clone reminds Peter not to give up on MJ and says to live his life to the fullest. As the clone, now known as Ben Riley, swings off into the distance, leaving Peter to ponder and figure out the rest of the mystery on his own. However, before we do end the episode, we cut to Norman Osborn as he arrives to Professor Miles Warren's lab. He searches and scatters through the littered paper, tables and chairs and destruction caused by all the many battles there over the last couple of episodes. He picks up a journal from the corner of the room with Professor Miles Warren's name written on it. He opens the book. It's all his research, his notes. He flicks all the way to the end to find what he was hoping for. His suspicions made true. Peter Parker is Spider-Man. Episode 10, The Christmas Dinner. We open the episode dramatically. Roderick Kingsley is arrested on sight. The police, including Captain Gene DeWolf, take him away as he pleads in the back of a car for clarity as to what he has done. As he steps into the cop car, he asks again, when Gene DeWolf says, Roderick Kingsley, you're under arrest for the murder of innocent civilians and citywide destruction under the alias, the Green Goblin. We cut to Peter and Aunt May who are sitting on the sofa. Peter hasn't had time to think about May much, but he's glad that all of the clone stuff is finally over and he can focus on getting back to helping her. He sees some of the letters on the side. It's more bills. Even with Aunt May running ragged at feast, she still can't seem to afford to pay the bills where she needs to. The constant destruction brought on by Spider-Man and his foes is raising the prices of New York housing as tax goes up. People like May can't afford to keep herself afloat. Even if she retires, she'll have nothing left. Peter knows he has to start looking for another job again. And then there's a knock at the door. It's Mary Jane. Peter says hi awkwardly as she enters their home. Aunt May gives her a hug and invites her in as it is revealed that Mary Jane is officially moving in with them. After the partial destruction of her home during the man-spider attack and after the death of her aunt, she has nowhere to go. Aunt May kindly said that she could stay with her and Peter for as long as she wants. However, things between Peter and MJ still aren't at their best. MJ is still closed off, more closed off than she's ever been. Her exuberant personality is nowhere to be seen. She's quiet and timid. Peter knows that he still needs to give her space. And for her, it can't be easy walking into the home of the guy she's literally trying her best to give a bit of room to. But he still needs to be there for her when she's ready. During all of this time, the TV is on in the background, reporting the news as it is revealed about Roderick Kingsley's arrest. Peter looks over to the TV as he becomes invested, as MJ goes off upstairs to set up the spare room. Peter becomes laser focused to the television, as it is then revealed that Norman Osborn is back in town. Peter, holding a glass of water, drops it and gasps. The glass smashes on the floor in front of him. His voice quivers with fear. This catches Aunt May and Mary Jane off guard. MJ turns around to inspect what has just happened from the top of the stairs, and Aunt May asks if Peter is okay as she rushes over to help him. 
Peter says he's okay. He'll clean it up. He makes up the excuse that he just dropped it by accident. Peter carries on watching the TV when Norman Osborne comes on for an interview. The reporter asks Norman about the goblin incident, and Norman reveals that the goblin wasn't ever him. Kingsley framed him this entire time and tried to kill him in the process. Norman explains that he escaped Kingsley's grasp and finally got him arrested for his actions. As far as the world is aware, the Green Goblin was Roderick Kingsley and not Norman Osborn. The news anchor then goes on to show footage that Peter could clearly tell had been doctored of Roderick Kingsley stealing the glider tech from Oscorp Industries. Peter gulps as he turns it off and sits down. Nothing said, no monologue, no internal narration. His eyes said it all, the fear and the terror. We cut to school and it's the final day before the Christmas break. Everyone is finalizing their college applications, ready to submit them in the following year. Peter still doesn't know what he wants to do. However, on the MJ side of things at a college workshop that all the students will attend, she will attend a booth for an acting school. She will be slightly interested, but hesitant. As this episode goes on, it will become clearer that MJ continually becomes interested in this acting school and will really like the look of it. MJ being closed off and not being able to handle or display emotion correctly will see this as an escape. She will see this as something that she can do where she can play someone else because being Mary Jane Watson right now kind of sucks. She wish that she could be someone else, anyone else. This idea infatuates her and she becomes more interested in the acting course. Peter will also be there attending this workshop as well. He looks around. Biologist? Well, we all saw how that turned out. Engineer? Nah. Author? Absolutely not. Teacher? Well, he tutored Liz one time, maybe. He laughs it off thinking to himself that if there's a superhero course, he'd smash that. Peter returns home that day and Aunt May seems more excited than usual to see him. Peter smiles and asks what's going on. When May tells him that he's had an invite, Peter asks what for. And May tells Peter that she's had a personal invite from Norman Osborne for a Christmas themed dinner at his place as a celebration of his return. He wants to invite them because of how good friends Peter was with Harry. Peter gulps and says yes, even though he'd really like to say no. But I guess this could be a good time to scope out this whole thing, Peter will think to himself. Why not keep an extra eye on Norman Osborne? See what's really going on. We cut to the dinner. Peter arrives at the Osborne mansion, arriving at the door with a security guard at the front. It's been a while since Peter has been inside this place, but funny enough, he remembers it like it was yesterday. He walks through to the dinner table as Norman is sat at the other end on his laptop. Norman realizes and shuts it, leaping up from his chair as it seems like Peter and May were the first to arrive. Norman says he's sorry for being so rude. He didn't see them walk in. Norman makes the long journey over to Peter, his eyes connecting with his. Peter hasn't seen this man in years, but it feels like he never left. On his way over, he has time to ask Peter how he's been and that it's been a while. Peter will say it sure has, Mr. O, as Norman offers his hand out. Peter shakes it. However, Norman's grip was unusually tight. Norman tells Peter to cut that out. It's Norman, remember. Peter gives an awkward smirk as Norman lets go of his hand. Norman turns to May and greets her as well. They both sit down at the table as Norman gestures them to their seats. Before other guests start arriving, Norman starts quizzing Peter, asking him about his personal life and how he's getting on at school, and if he's applied to any colleges. Peter has always known Norman to be invested in his personal development through school, but was never invested as he was making out to be. Peter asks Norman how Harry is getting on, and Norman says that he's fine. He's almost completed his European tour. Peter says he looks forward to seeing him again. Norman cracks a slight smirk. The dinner goes on as the other guests arrive. Peter sweatily eats his food very cautiously, eyeing every plate that comes out from the kitchen. Nothing set off his spider sense yet, but the good thing for Peter's sake is that Norman doesn't know who he is, or at least that's what Peter thinks. As the desserts come round, guests start mingling in different areas of the room, drinking champagne. And just when he thought he was in the clear, Peter's spider sense does go off. Peter jumps up from the table to cover Aunt May, expecting a pumpkin bomb of some kind when someone flies through the window, smashing it in the process. It's the beetle person from a few weeks ago. Peter will say to himself that he forgot about this one as everyone starts cowering for safety. Peter guides Aunt May out of the room as he jumps into action in his Spider-Man gear, kicking the beetle in the face. The beetle and Spider-Man engage in battle. However, it is over pretty quickly as Spider-Man comes out on top. It's not long before Jean DeWolf arrives on the scene as well. The beetle's mask is pulled off to be revealed to be Janice Lincoln, the new girl in Peter's class. 
Peter is shocked by this, but for some reason it all made sense. It must have been the Lincoln name. Norman Osborn comes over and thanks Spider-Man personally, saying it's good to see him again. But Peter notices that he's acting really odd, almost like everything had fallen into place, almost as if he was a pawn in some great scheme, and almost as if Norman was expecting that attack. However, after everything is said and done, Peter returns to his civilian clothing to escort Aunt May home that night. We cut to a few days later. It's Christmas Day and spirits are relatively low. However, as Peter sat on the end of his bed flicking through different college courses, there is a knock at his door. He opens it to reveal MJ on the other side. He invites her in and she says that she wants to talk. She tries to talk, but she can't. She just hugs Peter. Peter says that it's okay. MJ tells him that she didn't know how to react after her aunt died. She died because of Peter, but that wasn't his fault. None of this was his fault. But she couldn't help but think that if she hadn't wrapped herself up in his life, that things would have turned out differently. Not just for her, but for her aunt as well. Peter looks down and apologizes. MJ says he's not to apologize. She tells him that she's been looking at acting recently and that she thinks she's gonna go to an acting college. Peter says that he's happy for her. However, she explains that the more engrossed she became in the idea of escaping and becoming another character, and to take acting seriously, the more she realized that she was leaving her old self and other problems behind. Because she doesn't need to be someone else to feel love. When she has him, she will say as she looks up into Peter's eyes. She will say that she chose to be with Peter, and it was her decision, even if he is Spider-Man, and she's going to stick by that. She will stick by him. She will explain as she places her hand on his. She will tell him that she loves him as they kiss on the edge of his bed. Peter will smile and say that he loves her too. And as MJ came back around, a little bit of joy over Christmas shrouds the ever-growing terror brought back to New York City by Norman Osborn and the return of Spider-Man's greatest ever foe. Episode 11, College Calling. We kick off this episode with Peter and Mary Jane at a carnival. They are having a good time and playing on some carnival-like games. MJ will pull Peter aside and tell him how much she loves him, and they will embrace. Until, in the very distance, Peter can see smoke out of the corner of his eye start to rise to the sky. And in an orange flash, an explosion can be heard from the same place. People start screaming around them as Peter gets MJ to safety, as he scurries to try and see what the commotion is about. But before he can get into his Spider-Man gear, he hears a scream behind him. Peter swiftly turns around to see MJ in the air above him. A light humming noise can be heard as a man in a purple and green costume stands afoot, a glider hovering above Peter, laughing maniacally. It's the green goblin. Peter begs him to put MJ down, but the goblin refuses, saying that he will be brought to reckoning. Peter frowns as he angrily states for the goblin to put Mary Jane down once again, but the goblin laughs again, and MJ gasps, as a blade strikes her through the heart. Peter screams out as her limp body crashes to the floor. And all of a sudden, Peter wakes up, jolting out of bed, sweating and panting. A bad dream, Peter will think to himself. Peter places his face in the palm of his hands as he sighs and gets out of bed to go to the bathroom. He washes his face with water, and tries to wake himself up a bit. This is when it's revealed that this isn't the first time Peter has had this dream ever since Norman had made his return to New York and revealed that he never actually died in the first place, Peter has been having reoccurring dreams of losing someone close to him to the Green Goblin. And that person, more often than not, is Mary Jane. Peter's decision to push Gwen Stacy away originally was so that she wouldn't get caught up in any of this. But then Mary Jane came along and made him realize that he can't be afraid to get close to the people that he loves. When now with the return of Norman Osborn, that fear is back. The fear of losing her, and the fear of losing to him. We cut to a few scenes in Midtown High, as everyone is finalizing their college applications. Once again, we will get reminded that Flash Thompson is going to be on his way to the military, Liz Allen is going to be doing a journalism degree, and MJ is finalizing an application to go to an acting school. Peter meets with Mary Jane in the hallway. MJ asks if Peter has had any time to think about what he wants to do at college, and Peter says he hasn't really, and he doesn't think he will. MJ asks why, and Peter will hesitantly tell her about the dreams that he's been having. He doesn't want to freak MJ out, and he doesn't want to scare her away, but he feels like he has to be honest with her. Peter says there's something that I've never told you about one of the villains that I fought as Spider-Man. As Peter goes on to explain the story of Norman Osborn 
and the Green Goblin, the most psychologically draining villain that Peter has ever had to face. MJ will ask Peter, why are you so scared of him? And Peter says he's not scared of the Green Goblin, he's scared of Norman Osborn. Norman is clever, smart, calculated, wealthy, and will do anything to get what he wants. Ever since he found out Norman Osborn was the Green Goblin, the Goblin's motives, the way he conducts himself, the way the Goblin can manipulate anyone, it all made sense with Norman behind the mask. Peter doesn't know if he's just being paranoid, but ever since he went to that dinner, he feels like Norman is onto him. He feels like Norman is almost spying on him. MJ will go on to ask Peter if Norman knows he's Spider-Man, and Peter will say he doesn't think so, or at least when they fought last, he never did find out. MJ will tell Peter that he's got nothing to worry about then, he's going to be fine, and Peter will say he guesses so, but MJ doesn't know Norman like he does. If Norman Osborn wanted to know who Spider-Man was, he would find out, and MJ not knowing the ramifications of the situation will dismiss Peter's worries, but Peter knows what he's going up against, and it's all he can think about at the moment. He can't even think about college. Peter will carry on walking down the hallway to his next lesson, when he turns the corner and all the students had gone. A tall figure stands at the end of the hallway. He could ever so slightly make out a green and purple glow. The voice will say hello in the cackling manner of the goblin. Peter will gasp, and as the goblin starts to approach him from the other end of the hallway, the professor will shout Peter's name, and once again, Peter will wake up with his head rising from the desk. It's the end of the day, and class is over. The professor will pull Peter aside as all the other students leave. The professor will ask Peter if he's getting a lot of sleep because he slept through the last portion of his class. Peter will say he's fine, he just didn't sleep well last night. And the professor will tell Peter that he heard about what happened with his brother. Peter will sympathize with the professor and will tell Warren that he's sorry about what happened. But the professor will tell Peter not to worry about him. Like he's mentioned before, he never really was that close with his brother. But he will also go on to say that if Peter ever needs to talk about anything, he's always there for him. The professor is just cautiously worried that Peter may be slightly traumatized from working with his brother. Yet, does he know that Peter's actually Spider-Man? Peter will thank him anyway, as he leaves the class to his way home. As Peter makes his way home, his spider sense will go off. Peter will look around, praying that it's not another hallucination or a dream. The goblin is nowhere to be seen. This must mean it's real. And that's when he realizes cop cars driving past him at atomic rates. Peter sees this as a good thing. Maybe a bit of crime will help take his mind off things. And just in a few moments, Peter will swing towards the scene of the crime as Spider-Man. And to Peter's surprise, it will be the Shocker? Peter will jump down to greet the Shocker and will ask him, how many times have we done this now, Montana? The Shocker will turn around, almost confused. And when the Shocker speaks, he will soon realize that it's not Montana at all through the more Northern-like accent. However, the suit, the gauntlets, the posture, and even the entire arsenal and weaponry all match that of the Shocker. Spider-Man, more jokingly, will tell the Shocker that that's plagiarism and it isn't good. He could get sued for using Montana's identity. The new Shocker will tell Spider-Man to get out of his way. And Spider-Man will tell him, I don't think you know how this works. However, Spider-Man seems slightly rusty. The lack of sleep and the constant worry at the back of his mind of Norman Osborn's return seems to have played his mind. And because of this, the Shocker will end up getting away. Gene DeWolf will arrive on the scene and will ask what's going on. Spider-Man usually catches those sort of guys. Spider-Man will tell her that he's not feeling himself recently. He just needs to get back into the groove of things. DeWolf says that's understandable. DeWolf will go on to question Peter about the whole man-spider saga and whatever happened to that giant raging spider monster thing. She was meaning to ask him. Spider-Man will tell her that it would take him a while to explain the whole situation. Maybe he should another time. Right now, he's just going to focus on trying to catch the shocker guy. DeWolf will be able to tell Spider-Man is slightly off. Just before he leaves, she'll pull him aside and tell him that he should take the day off or a few days off. She doesn't know who he is personally, but she can tell that a mental toll has been placed upon him. Spider-Man will tell her that he can't because with great power comes great responsibility. He'll always stick by that. As he swings off, leaving DeWolf to analyze the crime scene. The rest of the episode will be focused on Spider-Man trying to track down the Shocker. He will search high and low around the city until the Shocker commits another crime. Another battle will ensue with the Shocker. This time, Peter does eventually come out on top, and the Shocker is revealed to be none other than Herman Schultz, a man who idolized Montana's Shocker and was inspired by the crimes that he committed. Peter will say out of all his villains that he could have idolized, he probably picked the weirdest and worst one of them all. This episode's villain will be more of just a villain of the week type villain, as the looming threat and fear of Norman Osborn casts a shadow over the entire episode, and the entire final few episodes of this series as a whole. 
Peter will return home that night, and MJ has officially handed in all of her applications. Aunt May will congratulate her, and will ask Peter if he's had any time to think about what college he wants to go to, and what he wants to study. And Peter hesitantly once again says he hasn't really had much time to think about it. On Peter's way up to bed, he finds letters and bills, all overdue and all rising. Peter realises that he still needs to think about a job as well. He looks to the paper and finds an advert for a news agency called Frontline, saying that they're hiring for photographers. Peter looks into it and finds that the head publisher is none other than Robbie Robertson. Peter smirks as he realises this could be a brilliant opportunity. Him and Robbie have worked together for years before the bugle went under. This could be his chance once again to start taking pictures of Spider-Man. It is also revealed in these collections of scenes as well that MJ will also be working at Feast for the foreseeable future until she goes off to college. Not only will it allow her to gain some work experience before she goes to college, but it will also be a way of trying to help May out with the bills as well. May will tell her that she doesn't need to help her in her kind and stubborn ways, but MJ will say that she allowed her to stay with her until she goes to college. This is the least that she could do. And Aunt May will thank her for that. However, we come to the end of the episode. It's been a rough few days for Peter Parker, but the dread and the fear of Norman Osborn still looms over Peter's mind. He can't escape it. He won't escape it. As he looks towards MJ, he has a feeling somewhere deep inside him that no one, not him, and not the ones he loves, are in any way safe, as long as Norman Osborn is a free man. Episode 12, Turn Off the Light. We open up to a flashback of Peter and Aunt May from when Peter was a child. It's right after his parents had left him, and Aunt May turns the light off in his bedroom as he was about to go to sleep. However, Peter calls May back in and tells her to leave the lights on. May tells Peter that everything will be alright, he doesn't need to be scared of the dark. She tells him that one day he'll have to face his fear, and that he can't leave the light on for the rest of his life. Peter sulks, but agrees with her, knowing that she's right. She tells him to leave the light off tonight, and to tell her how he feels in the morning. Peter was scared, but knew she was right. All he has to do is face his fear. May turns the light off and tells Peter she loves him as she leaves the room. Against all odds, Peter perseveres and goes to sleep soundly. We open up in modern day. Peter is rough and restless. He hasn't slept, but he can't sleep because he's afraid. He's afraid of one man in particular, Norman Osborn. He's afraid of what his dreams might tell him. He's afraid of what the darkness may bring. He makes his way downstairs when he realises, oh no, he's late. Since the last episode, Peter has applied for the job at Frontline with Robbie Robertson and had actually scored an interview. He was meant to attend it this morning, but Peter's antics and nightmares of Norman Osborn's impending return have clouded his mind to the point where it's all he can think about. We get quite a comedic montage of Peter trying to look decent enough to get out the door in time. He smells his armpits in the process, and he reeks. He doesn't have time for a shower, however, so he tries to spray as much deodorant as possible on himself as he makes his way out the door. And as Peter tries to get to Frontline as quick as possible, this is when we cut to MJ, who is at Feast, working with Aunt May. May is showing MJ around the facilities, and once again appreciates MJ helping them. May takes the time to tell MJ that she owes her double time. She's not only working at Feast, which is helping ease the pressure off May, but she's also helping with the bills as well. MJ says it's okay. However, the scene turns very somber, as MJ sits May down for a second, as MJ can clearly see how overwhelmed the job makes her. She asks her if she's okay, and May says she's fine, but that's not what MJ is alluding to. MJ asks after everything that happened with her aunt, Anna Watson, is she doing okay? May tries to hold back her tears to show her strength. She's usually the one looking after people, not people looking after her. May says these things happen. It happened to Ben, and one day it'll happen to her. But all she can do is live on. Carry on doing what's right. Carry on helping the people that she loves. MJ sheds a tear as well, as May returns the question. She asks MJ if she's doing okay. MJ says it's hard but her and Peter have been helping her get through it, and she can't thank them enough for it. They hug it out, as the scene holds for a second. We cut back to Peter, who is swinging frantically through New York, trying to make it to the address of the Frontline HQ. He is trying to hold his phone, looking at the address whilst also swinging, similar to the scene from Spider-Man Far From Home. He makes it to Frontline about five minutes after his interview was meant to begin. We cut to Robbie Robertson, who is looking at his watch, and wonders where he is. Peter enters the office as Robbie welcomes him with open arms, and Peter apologises for being late. However, Robbie says that's never been his speciality. Robbie tells Peter that he liked what he did at the Bugle, but he wants something a little more. He wants to spin a positive note on Spider-Man. He wants to see a little bit more of the good that he does around the city instead of just fighting the bad guys. 
He felt like Jonah always put a negative spin on everything Spider-Man did, but Robbie wants to do something a bit different. Robbie tells Peter there's a market for it, and he thinks that since he gave the best pictures of Spider-Man, he is the right man for the job. Robbie will look at Peter suspiciously, however, as if to allude to the fact that he knows something more. However, this is looked over as a passing moment as they shake hands as Robbie offers him a freelance job, and Peter says thank you. Robbie says he isn't contracted to anything because he understands that he's still at school, but he will be in touch for some further details of other non-related Spider-Man stuff that he'd also like to do with him as well. Peter thanks him again as he heads home. Peter thinks to himself, that's the Bill situation covered. At least he's back as a photographer for the foreseeable future. That night, Peter is rolling around in his bed. He can't sleep. Flashes of the Green Goblin appear in his mind as he eventually screams out and sits up breathless. Then a knock at his door. Aunt May enters his room and sits down on the end of his bed. She asks him if he's okay, and Peter places his head in his hands. Peter looks over to the clock and notices it's 3am, and tells Aunt May that she needs to go to bed. She says she can't because he has been keeping her up with his sleep talking all night. He asks if he woke MJ, and May says no. She asks him what has been going on. She doesn't like to pry his personal space, but this is too much. She's worried about him. She asks if it's anything to do with Uncle Ben. After all, it's only been a few years since it happened. Peter hesitates and says no, but then tracks back and says yes, kind of. He tells her he's had this reoccurring dream where something bad will happen to someone close to him, like it did to Uncle Ben. Most of the time he's had the dream about MJ. May places her hand on his and tells him no one is going anywhere. She asks Peter what is causing it. Peter says he doesn't know. Obviously he does, but he can't tell Aunt May that. He can't tell her that he's Spider-Man. Aunt May gets up and makes her way to the door. On the way out, she tells Peter whatever is causing it, whenever he figures that out, he has to confront it face on. He can't ignore it. Turn off the light and don't be afraid. Peter makes the connection to the lesson that Aunt May taught him when he was a kid and realizes that maybe instead of running from his problems, he should face them instead. Aunt May tells him goodnight and Peter thanks her as he goes back to sleep. So the next morning, Peter looks towards his closet knowing his greatest battle awaits him, and running from it is delaying the inevitable. He slips his mask over his eyes and swings across New York City's morning skyline, elegantly, until he reaches the Osborne Mansion, the place of much drama over the years. His heart beat out of his chest. He didn't know what to expect, but he had to make sure. He had to face this fear head on. He made his way through the top window and into Norman Osborne's office. Norman is stood, leaning over his desk, organizing it for the day stood away from Spider-Man. However, Norman speaks first, as he felt the presence of the red and blue vigilante cross into his border. He says he's been expecting to see him. Spider-Man will say that it was about time that their paths crossed, as he leaps from the ceiling and makes a stamping entrance to the floor, trying to impose himself as much as possible. Norman chuckles as he stacks some paper. He will tell Spider-Man that he has no idea what he's gotten himself into, and Spider-Man will take a few steps forward, saying, what's that? And in one swift moment, Norman will shatter Peter's perception of reality with one sentence. You knew this talk was coming, didn't you, Peter? Spider-Man's eyes widen as he takes a few steps back. He looks around the room as if to wake up from another horrible dream. When Norman finally turns around to face him, a sinister look in his eye. Norman slowly makes his way forward, taking each step with such precision. Spider-Man will say he doesn't know what he means, nervously. And Norman will say, you know exactly what I mean, Peter. I know who you are, and I know what you are. I want you to know that I've been on this quest, on this road for a long time. My plan foiled, my intentions crushed, and there was only one man to blame. Spider-Man. After my presumed death, I took time to go into hiding, to reevaluate and to rethink my strategies. If I wanted to continue my climb to the top, I had to remove the thing that was holding me back, the thing that stops me from achieving what I wanted. I tried various different methods. I tried getting people to do my dirty work for me, Norman will explain as Peter gets flashes to the Sinister Six. Norman will continue by saying, The more I relied on other people, the more I realized it made me weaker. And that's when I approached Professor Warren. If I were to kill you, I wanted to do it in the most effective way possible, like no one would even know that you were gone. So I came up with the insane idea for him to help clone you so I could study you, learn what made you tick, to understand you in and out, to finally be able to take you out in one fail swoop. And after various tests, mishaps, and failures, Professor Warren finally did it. But that's when I realized I had a bigger problem on my hands. Spider-Man wasn't another random New Yorker. He was you. 
Spider-Man was Peter Parker. And that's when I knew I had to see for myself. Norman will explain, as everything from earlier in the season with Professor Warren and the cloning of Peter all came together in Peter's mind and for the audience. It all made sense. It was all connected this entire time. Peter will point his finger and raise his voice, saying, so those attacks on the mansion, they were you? Norman will look down, almost in regret, as he carries on talking. Yes, but I didn't believe it when I found out your secret. I always had so much respect for you, and now there's no doubt in my mind why I did. But I had to make sure for myself. That is why I did what I did. Norman will sigh as he speaks up again. He will say, I never wanted it to come to this, but you saved my son from himself. And I know a part of the reason why you went off the deep end was because of me. Because I wasn't there for him. But you made sure he was safe. You brought him back. And for that, I will forever be in debt to you. And it's because of this that I will give you one chance and one chance only, Peter. Stay out of my way, or I will kill you and every single last person that you love. Got it? Says Norman, as at this point he is very close to Peter, almost towering over him. Peter doesn't know how to respond. Norman walks back over to his desk and grabs some things as he heads for the elevator. Peter still stood in the same position, watches him all the way over. But before Norman leaves, he says one more thing. Oh, I heard you got a new girlfriend. She's pretty, he will say as the elevator door closes and Norman is out of sight. The message behind the last phrase angered Peter. His fist clenched and his mouth quivered. This is it. This is his final battle as we draw the episode to a close right there. Episode 13, The Night of Love and Grief. We open our final episode with Peter swinging through the city in his costume. He is narrating the past events of all five seasons, highlighting key moments that led him to this point. He points out times where he could have done things differently, maybe helped Harry a little bit better when he was taking the green, or maybe how he could have made things work with Gwen or how he ended up treating Liz. Or maybe he should have been there for Aunt May sooner, or not have been so naive when it came to Miles Warren. There are so many things he could have done differently. He thinks back to Emma Edwards, Captain Stacy. So many people suffered because of Spider-Man, because Spider-Man wasn't quick enough, strong enough. Who else has to suffer because of him? Because of the human error that plagues every decision he's ever made? During all of this, however, Peter will be getting photos as he starts to get back into photography, following his new job at Frontline but he'll still be thinking to himself. All he can do is focus on the future, focus on the now, make the right choice. His biggest threat awaits him. He has to save everyone. However, all this Norman Osborn stuff, it's set him back. His mindset has changed. Norman does know who he is, and he knows pretty much everyone he loves, including Mary Jane Watson. He knows it's a scare tactic, but if there's one of his villains that would go to extreme lengths to hurt Peter Parker, it would be Norman Osborn, AKA the Green Goblin. He's insane. As Peter is swinging, however, he will notice a crime going down in the corner of his eye. He swings down to deal with it. However, he notices something odd. They're all wearing pumpkin masks. After clearing it up, he realizes Norman just isn't back. He wants to take New York back for his own. As this revelation comes to the forefront, we cut to Norman Osborn who sips a drink and places the glass down on the desk in front of him rather firmly. Emily walks in and asks if he wants anything and Norman says no. Emily tells him he looks stressed and Norman says he's fine, and to just leave him. She leaves him, and Norman thinks back to Spider-Man. His whole plan went out the window as soon as he realized who Spider-Man was. Norman's morality and ethically driven side took over. The side of him that cared enough about his son also had empathy for Peter Parker. His plan to kill Spider-Man so he could have reign above New York as the big man replacing all those that had come before him had failed for a second time. Because as long as Spider-Man exists, there also exists a chance that his plan fails the same way it did at the end of season two all of those years ago. Except now there's a benefactor. He knows something that he didn't know back then, and that's Spider-Man's identity. And that makes things all the more difficult for him. The Goblin Nation is back, but how long is it before the masked menace intervenes once again? Norman contemplates as he looks towards his window, which faced the city. He wondered how long it would take before his opposition struck. We cut to MJ. She sat on the sofa at Peter's house reading a book. It's on acting. We get quite a funny scene as she tries to pull faces to copy expressions from the book as she's trying to learn before she goes to acting school, when Peter lands at the bottom of the stairs, startling her. She turns around swiftly and tells Peter that she hates how he never comes through the front door. She can never tell if he's in the house or not. Peter says that's just one of the perks of living with him. 
MJ asks Peter how the heck Aunt May hasn't guessed he's Spider-Man yet. Surely she has her suspicions. MJ tells Peter that if she lived here for two weeks and didn't know, she'd find out straight away. Peter shrugs his shoulders and tells her that she's just more observant than most. However, Peter is stressed. The look on his face tells MJ everything she needs to know. As the conversation turns somber, Peter sits on the sofa next to her and she asks what's wrong. As she puts her arm around him, Peter tells her he knows. MJ asks, who knows? And Peter says Norman Osborn knows who he is. MJ looks down and doesn't know what to say. Peter tells her that he confronted him. He wanted to make sure for certain. And he knows. MJ asks, what now? And Peter says Norman wouldn't do anything unless he got in his way. As Peter says that, however, a news flash comes on the telly of multiple accounts around the city of people in pumpkin masks like the finale of season two. MJ asks if this was his plan all along. To get Spider-Man out of the picture, to enact this takeover of New York. Peter says it seems that way. Peter says that Norman has never really been the type to be involved in the criminal underworld, or at least that's what he thought. But I guess when you think about it, Norman Osborn is power hungry, and the more of New York he can control on the surface or underneath is the merrier. Peter says he doesn't know what to do, because if he gets involved, it puts her in danger. It puts Aunt May in danger. It puts everyone he knows in danger. MJ tells him he can't possibly think like that. MJ locks eyes with Peter and speaks directly at him. She tells him that if he goes in with that mindset, then the general public and civilians will get hurt because of Norman Osborn. It doesn't matter what happens to her. People will die if Peter doesn't stop him. Peter looks down and says he doesn't want to lose her. MJ grabs him by his chin and pulls his face to meet hers. As she says, it's not going to. She kisses Peter and Peter relaxes. As they pull away, Peter says she's right. He's Spider-Man and that's the right thing to do. He has to stop. Norman Osborn. Peter decides just like the last episode, instead of waiting for Goblin's next move, maybe it's best if he takes this head on and confront Norman where he least expects it, the Osborn mansion. Take the fight to him, don't wait for him to take the fight to Peter. However, on his swing over there, Peter encounters more Goblin outposts and crime activity. Peter can't ignore it, so swings down to deal with it. During the fight, he manages to web up all the thugs, however, a few apartment blocks were severely damaged in the process. A man collapses to his knees outside of one of the apartments, crying as he's lost everything. Peter approaches him and tells him it'll be okay. There's a place that he can stay. Spider-Man swings the man over to Feast and drops him off. Spider-Man enters Feast and tells Aunt May that this is a man who needs a place to stay and if there's any room for him. May will tell Spider-Man that there isn't really, but they'll try and make room. They're already pretty packed up from the past year gone. Spider-Man nods in acknowledgement. However, as Spider-Man hands the person over, the man grins very slyly and a smirk turns into a laugh as he turns to Spider-Man. Peter's spider sense goes berserk. What's happening? As he pulls out a pumpkin bomb from his pocket, Spider-Man webs the bomb away from the man and May as it explodes in his face, sending him back. People in Feast start screaming as they head for the doors. However, they're all locked. They can't get out. Peter stumbles to his feet as he looks towards Aunt May and then the lights flicker off. It's dark. People scramble as Peter tells everyone to stay calm. And then the lights flicker back on as none other than the Green Goblin appears in front of Spider-Man, face to face with each other once again. Spider-Man clenches his fist as the Goblin hops down off his glider, telling him he fell right into his trap. Peter asks the Goblin to take this somewhere else, away from all of these people. The Goblin says no as he laughs. He tells Peter this is exactly where he wants to be. He tells Peter that he said to stay out of his way, but he didn't. And this is his consequence. The goblin turns to May and says, even May is here for the show. May whispers underneath her quivering voice as she realizes, Peter? Peter turns to lock eyes with May, telling her it's gonna be okay. All of this is happening as people are still scrambling to try and get the doors open. They don't even pay attention to what is going on. The goblin speaks up, saying that there is no use in leaving. There are bombs tied to every corner of this place and they will detonate if Spider-Man doesn't do what he says. They have about 15 minutes on them. Peter breathes heavily and tells the Goblin he's bluffing. Goblin snarkily leans in with one eye and says, am I? As a chuckle lightly leaves his mouth. He tells Peter to surrender or else it doesn't end well for any of them. Spider-Man drops to his knees. The Goblin takes heavy steps towards him as Aunt May's fist clenches as she grits her teeth. The Goblin takes one hand and lifts up Spider-Man's chin to meet his face. The goblin tells him he's lost as he chuckles. And in a quick lapse of motion, 
The goblin turns to May and swoops her up as he hops on his glider and smashes through the ceiling window and away. Spider-Man quickly leaps up and tells him to get back here as he webs after him. Spider-Man chases the goblin a couple of blocks across the city as he kicks him off his glider and catches Aunt May. Spider-Man lands on top of a building and places Aunt May down as the goblin tumbles and lands on the same building. He gets up, laughing. He throws goblin bats towards Spider-Man as he leaps and dodges them, stopping them from hitting May in the process. Spider-Man fights the goblin hand-to-hand -hand on the rooftop. The goblin seems faster and stronger than before, outmaneuvering Spider-Man. But Spider-Man is also stronger. All the battles he's faced since his last encounter with Norman have made him stronger. Norman whacks Peter around the face, knocking the corner of his mask off. He then delivers a blow to the jaw, which knocks Peter back. Norman picks Peter up by the throat and activates blades on the side of his arm and tells him this is his end. And he's going to kill him. And then he's going to kill May. And then he's going to kill Mary Jane. The goblin laughs sadistically. However, during this time where Peter is helpless, Aunt May sneaks up to the back of the goblin, picking up the closest object to her that she could find, and shouts to stay away from her nephew as she clobbers the goblin around the back of the head with it. However, in retaliation, the goblin drops Spider-Man and lashes out at Aunt May, hitting her across the face of the building with his arm. Peter shouts at the goblin. As he turns back to face Peter, he doesn't hold back and delivers one gut-wrenching punch to his jaw, sending the goblin back. However, the goblin comes back at Peter, and a final showdown between the two of them ensues, the goblin and Peter both going full force. Peter, however, doesn't hold back as he usually would, telling the goblin that he should kill him for hurting her. As the hand-to-hand -hand combat eventually comes to an end, Peter topples the goblin and comes out on top. Peter is beating down on the goblin's face as his mask rips to see Norman underneath, barely conscious. Peter has him by the collar and realizes what he's doing. He drops him and rushes over to see if May is okay. May says that she's okay, and Peter looks down. The goblin didn't just swipe her, he swiped her with his blade. You're bleeding, Peter will say to May. May says it's fine, it's just sore. Peter tells her he needs to get her up, as he starts to panic. He says they're gonna get her to a hospital. May tells him no. Peter says yes, they're getting her to a hospital. His eyes start to swell. Peter says no. He's forgetting something. The bomb's at feast. He needs to make sure those people are okay. Peter says he's not leaving her. May tells him to stop thinking about her. Those people need Spider-Man. They need her nephew. Peter says he's not going to lose her. May tells him she's so proud of him. Of everything he's done. All the people he's helped. Some part of her all this time knew. She knew that he was Spider-Man. The late nights, the constant secrets. It was all because he was doing the right thing. She tells him that Uncle Ben would also be so proud of him. Peter cries. He screams. He says he's not leaving. He doesn't care. He's not leaving her. He can't leave her. May tells him to go. Be the hero that she knows he is. Be Spider-Man. But Peter can't. He tries to force himself to stand up, but he can't. He can't lose May as well. But May tells him to go. Go now before it's too late. Peter says, I love you. Quivering in his voice as he stands up and leaps off the edge of the building. Knowing that he has to save all of those people. May Parker watches on as her nephew swings into the distance, proud of the man that he's become. A single tear rolling down her cheek as she closes her eyes and takes a deep breath. Peter arrives to feast. He can barely see in front of him. Emotions cloud his every sense, except for one, his spider sense. He dials into it like never before and it allows him to lead him to the bombs, deactivating one by one, saving everyone inside. Hundreds of people saved by Spider-Man. And as the last bomb is deactivated, just in the nick of time, we cut to black. A news broadcast leads us back into the episode, as it reports the release of Roderick Kingsley from prison, because the real Green Goblin, Norman Osborn, has finally been arrested and brought to justice. Unfortunately, there was one casualty that Spider-Man failed to save, May Parker, beloved aunt and head of the Feast Center. We cut to outside the Feast Center as a memorial plaque is put up in her honor. The reporter says her funeral is set to take place later today. We then cut over to May's funeral. It's somber. The camera movement's slow. Peter stands there with an umbrella as the vicar gives a speech. MJ links arms with him and places her head on his shoulder for comfort. Peter sheds a tear. In the background, we see Gwen Stacy who has returned to New York for her funeral. She gives Peter one last hug 
as they see each other for the first time in over a year. We also see hiding away in a tree in the background, Ben Riley, who also heard of the news and sheds a tear in her passing. A great woman was lost that day. We cut as we hear our first words from Peter since it happened. He looks towards his Spider-Man costume as we cut to him sat in his bedroom. This mask has brought him nothing but pain, suffering, guilt, and regret, but Uncle Ben and Aunt May wouldn't want him to be any other way. Uncle Ben taught him responsibility, but Aunt May taught him that it's okay to carry on. It's okay to accept that you can't save everyone. Her death isn't a reason to stop being Spider-Man, but a reason to carry on. Peter Parker is Spider-Man more than ever, and will live on in her name. In this series of events, we also get a short shot of a letter which tells us that the house is also getting sold. It's the end of an era. We then cut one last time to Midtown High as everyone is saying their goodbyes on their final day. Flash sees Peter in the hallway. They handshake as Flash tells Peter good luck on the future. Flash then says what the heck and brings Peter in for a hug. It's nice. Flash places his hand on Peter's shoulder and says he's sorry for all the torment he gave him. And he's really going to miss him actually. Peter says he will too. Peter tells him good luck in the military. Flash nods as he walks off in the other direction. Peter sees Liz and approaches her. He says that he knows they didn't always see eye to eye, but he hopes she's okay. Liz says thanks and tells Peter good luck with whatever he's doing. Peter smiles as she leaves. And finally, Peter sees MJ. They give each other a hug as Peter asks if she's ready for acting school. She says no, but she's excited. Peter says he hopes he still gets to see her. And MJ says, of course, she's staying in New York after all. MJ asks him if he's decided what he wants to do. And he says that he doesn't think college would work for a stay up all night superhero. He says he'll figure it out. We then cut to Peter entering Frontline as Robbie wanted to see him. Robbie says that he knows he's only worked here for a short time, but wanted to offer Peter a full-time job as a photographer. Peter is surprised and thanks Robbie. Robbie says he's just left school and with everything going on with his aunt, I bet he needs something to latch onto. Plus, he's the best photographer in the business. Peter couldn't be happier as he shakes Robbie's hand. Something positive for Peter to think about. Robbie says he only met his aunt a few times, but she was a good woman, and he's truly sorry for her loss. Peter says thank you to Robbie. She'd appreciate that. Robbie smiles as Peter leaves his office. We cut to three months later. Peter is setting up his new apartment, as he now has the money to afford to do so. Peter is on the phone with MJ, as she's telling him about how the first week of her acting classes are going. She says that they're going great. Peter says that's good, as his radio beeps in the distance. There's a crime going down near Central Park. He says he's going to have to go. MJ asks if it's Spider-Man stuff. Peter says yeah. She lets him go, as Peter puts on his costume as he leaps out the window. Spider-Man gracefully swings through the New York City skyline elegantly. He's their protector. He's their savior. He truly is the spectacular Spider-Man. And with that, I bring you to the end of Spectacular Spider-Man. It has been one hell of a ride. I've really, really enjoyed this series. However, this is not the end. That may be the end of the series. However, it's not the end of the Spectacular Spider-Man story. Of course, I am going to be making three more Spectacular Spider-Man stories. And that, of course, will be the College Spider-Man trilogy following the same character at the end of season five so we've got three more movies with this character and i'm really excited to get going on the college trilogy i can give you the title of the first one which will be coming very very soon in a few weeks it will be called spectacular spider-man and the death of of Gene DeWolf. Hopefully you guys are excited and I can't wait to enter this new era of Spectacular Spider-Man with you guys. But with that being said, thank you guys for watching and I'll see you all in the next one. Take care and peace.